All right. Are we good to go? All right. Good morning. Calling this meeting to order at 9 o'clock. I'd like to start by reminding everyone that all public meetings are live streamed and recorded. Any verbal or written information provided may be included in public documents as per the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act or FOIP 41. I'd like to start with asking for the adoption of the agenda. Okay, Councillor Lang. Those in favor? That is carried seven to zero. The adoption of the minutes from November 24th, 2020. Councillor Swanson, all in favor? That is carried seven to zero. That brings us uh, to 4.1. It is my understanding that we have uh, a delegation that will be coming in. No? Thank you, uh, Reeve Laird. We have um, the applicants for the bylaw. Okay. 1103 attending, uh, Victor Benz and John Fennell is attending. Okay, do we need- um, Via Zoom. Uh, do we need a motion then to uh, allow them to come in uh, via electronic? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Councillor Duncan, those in favor? That's carried seven to zero. All right. Um, it's up to uh, our folks from planning and development to uh, get us started. Thank you, Reed Blair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, Council. Before you is bylaw 1103 20, which intends to one, add a new district to the county's land use bylaw, being the Clear Creek and North Raven River Buffer District, and two, to redesignate 33 for the sections of land from the Agriculture District to the Clear Creek and North Raven River Buffer District. The applicant is Victor Benz on behalf of the Alberta Fish and Game Association. The land proposed to be redesignated is located approximately 10, 10 kilometers northeast of the village of Caroline, east of Highway 22. The land is currently zoned agriculture. According to the applicants, the North Raven River and Clear Creek are ecologically unique and environmentally sensitive spring-fed watercourses. Given their sensitivity, they believe that a 1.8 kilometer buffer around the headwater springs of those uh, two rivers is needed to protect this area. The proposed new district is similar to the agriculture district with the exception that it prohibits any resource extraction below, below the water table in the subject area. It also includes development requirements such as no discretionary use, development shall create an open water body such as a pond or a lake other than dugouts. No discretionary use development shall permit any potentially harmful material to be deposited in the soil above the normal seasonal maximum water table or in an aquifer below the water table. The Municipal Planning Commission may decide to hold a public hearing for an application. And finally, all discretionary use development applications shall include a full environmental assessment report on the development's potential impact on the headwater springs of the Clear Creek and the North Raven River. The following shall be considered when reviewing this application. One, the applicant has not presented proof of consent from all property owners. The applicants, it should be noted that the applicants do own two properties in the area, uh, and they are approximately 142 acres. 
Usually, a redesignation of this magnitude starts with an overall arching policy in a municipal development plan, which is adopted by council. Council should also note that some potential legal challenges may arise if this redesignation is approved as no unanimous decision or consent from, the all, for, from all property owners has been obtained. Two, the applicant has not provided site-specific hydrological studies that demonstrate that a 1.8 kilometer buffer is needed to protect the headwater springs of the Clear Creek and the North Raven River. Some of the information provided by the applicant uh, has, his, it is based on research conducted in the United States, mostly in the Washington state area. Um, and three, if the proposed land use bylaw is approved and the land's redesignated, it may sterilize a large area of the county for gravel extraction. It would also open the possibility of redesignating similar areas within the county. It should be noted um, that the county currently has really a strong policies to protect environmental, uh, environmentally significant areas. So any application that comes to the county will be measured against those policies. So it's not like we don't have any policies in place. We have really strong policies in this regard. So based on the information submitted by the applicant, planning staff is unable to properly evaluate the application. Um, as a result, we're recommending that council refuse the application or defeat first reading of bylaw 1103-20. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Are we able to connect to Mr. Benz? Thank you, Riedler. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to our submission. I am Victor Benz, Environment Chair for the Alberta Fish and Game Association, Alberta's oldest conservation group. Just Mr. Benz, it would be our pleasure yes. to introduce ourselves before you get started. Thank I'm, you. I'm going to start with uh, Councillor Duncan. Good morning, Jim Duncan, Division 1. Uh, good morning, Daryl Lougheed, Division 3. Good morning, John Vandermeer, Division 4, and uh, uh, the area you're speaking of is in my division. Good morning, Mr. Benz. I'm Cami Laird. I'm a counselor for Division 2 and uh, the Reeve for the county. Good morning, Mr. Benz. My name is Teresa Lang, and I'm um, counselor for Division 5, which surrounds Rocky and goes through to the West Country. Good morning, gentlemen. My name is Tim Hoven. I'm the counselor for Division 6, which is uh, south of the area that we're talking about today. Good morning, Michelle Swanson, Division 7, everything north of Highway 12. Good morning, Maria Hagen, Director of Corporate Services. Good morning, Mr. Benz, Rick Emmons, CAO. All right, I think that you've uh, been introduced to the folks at this side. Um, I'm hopeful, because we, we have a very large agenda today, I'm hopeful that uh, we can curtail um, our discussion to 15 to 20 minutes. Will that work for you? That will work for me. All right, thank you. The, uh, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. As I said, I'm speaking as a volunteer for the representative of the AFGA on behalf of our land ownership partners, the Alberta Conservation Association, and Trout Unlimited Canada. I am a registered professional engineer and life member of the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Alberta. I also sit as a director on the national body, Engineers Canada. John. Thank you, Victor. Uh, good morning, Ms. Reeve and council members. My name is John Fennell. 
I am a member of the scientific community here in Alberta and have over 30 years of experience in natural resource evaluation. I am a long-standing member with the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Alberta, as well as many other professional organizations here in Western Canada and North America. Can we try to turn up the volume? I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Uh, Fennell, we're just, okay. Do you want to try carrying on from there? We're just trying to get the volume right here so we can hear you. Yeah, no problem, Ms. Reeve. Uh, I hold a, a number of degrees, including a bachelor's degree in geology, a master's degree in hydrogeology with a specialization in systematics, and a doctorate degree in geochemistry. Is that sound okay? Um, it's a little bit soft, but we'll uh, definitely try to work with it. We'll just pay uh, as best attention as we can given the electronic uh, equipment we're working with. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just to continue, my skills extend to the use of remote sensing in water resource assessment. The application of techniques in subsurface investigations, groundwater and water interaction studies, field program design execution, monitoring and management design, which includes statistical methods to identify change in core environmental forensic, risk assessment and risk management and climate impact assessment, including the development of adaptation strategies. My work experience has been gained here in Western Canada and abroad in countries such as Australia, Belize, Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, the United States, and Yemen, where I've worked for industry, government, world organizations such as the United Nations, academia, and the general public to understand and manage risks to surface water and groundwater studies. I have been working with the Alberta Fish and Game Association on the North Raven file for over a year now as a volunteer to assist with the continued protection of this unique prairie setting. Thank you. Thanks, John. After over 50 years and spending over $10 million in re rehabilitation, the North Raven River, Alberta's largest white zone spring fed river is now renowned the world over as a blue ribbon trout fishing destination, bringing a $750,000 annual injection into the local and Alberta economies. I wish to emphasize that the AFGA is neither anti-industry nor anti-gravel. However, there are special places in our province that are worthy of extra protection in the best interests of all Albertans, including future generations. This is one such place. We take issue with the planning and development characterization of our submission presented to Council on four major points. Over the 10 months we have worked on this proposal, the target set by planning and development for landowner consent has continually changed. It began with significant proportion, then a majority. After our initial submission in late September showing 73% consent, it became 80%. In the document now before you, it stands as unanimous consent. We have repeatedly asked for the formal documents that specify both the requirement for and the required level of formal consent. They have yet to be provided. As explained in our formal response of 6th of November, most of the supportive landowners were uncomfortable with giving formal public consent, raising concerns that ranged from affecting relationships with neighbors that do not share their perspective through to the potential misuse of that data when it is made public. We will continue to honor their concerns. Secondly, we have referenced and submitted six primary source science-based research reports to build the case for the 1.8 kilometer buffer. Primary source documents are peer reviewed, published papers reflecting current science. Several of our references do provide site specific data documenting the aquifer flow rate and the chemical water analyses. 
The direct data for the 1.8 kilometer buffer comes from other reports assessing the impact of existing below water table gravel pit operations on water quality in neighboring wells. To provide the same level of definitive data for our area of concern would require the construction, operation, and close monitoring of a commercial gravel pit within the 1.8 kilometer distance of the very springs we are trying to protect. This is exactly what we oppose. An analogy might be that if Ontario were to take a particular model of car and run it at a brick wall with certain things happening, and then Washington State were to do the same thing with the same model of car, run it at the same speed into the same brick wall, and the same things would happen. Would Alberta say that because you don't have site-specific data, we need to do the same thing, or will we accept the data from these other sources? Planning development suggests that our proposal, if approved, would sterilize a large area of the county for gravel extraction. First, our submission does not affect current or future above water table aggregate extraction within our area of concern. Secondly, our analysis of the Alberta Geological Survey assessment of Clearwater County's gravel resource indicates approximately 268 square miles of, a very, of available gravel area. That amounts to 3.7% of the total area of the county. Our area of concern, which is only 33 quarter sections, is only 3% of the total area of available gravel in the county. Finally, planning and development state that planning staff is unable to properly evaluate this application. On this, we agree. Without the input and the assistance of a competent hydrogeologist, proper evaluation of our submission is not possible. The involvement of such a professional is the responsibility of the county. The failure to do so leads directly to the uninformed recommendation to either refuse the application or defeat it at first reading. John and I are now available to answer any questions you may have of our proposal. All right, thank you, Mr. Benz. Uh, I'll open it up to uh, our council members uh, if you have any questions. Councillor Swanson. Yes, good morning. Um, I guess for me, I, this is more for planning. Um, water's jurisdiction in when it comes down to our gravel play applications falls on environment and parks, right? It falls on the province to mitigate that in as far as water. And f just supplementary to that, do we have a definition for what a dugout is in our land use by uh, land use, by, use by law or our MDP? Um, just to answer your question, thank you, Councillor. Um, yes, ultimately, it is the responsibility of the province to approve the gravel extraction operations. Um, but or initially, it is the county who reviews any application and then eventually goes to the, to the province. Um, regarding your second question, I'm just gonna have to- Yep, yep, that's what, while you're looking up, I guess for me is my comment is, it seems like it's a little bit cart before the horse. The government should be giving us first their approval before it comes back to the county, in my opinion. Yes, there's some certain things that we can restrict, but if the government is the ultimate authority on this, why would we go through a lot of work just to have the government turn it down if it's not in their line line of questioning or falls within their guidelines? So that's my uh, No, I don't, I don't see a definition for the government. Okay, thank you. All right. That's Victor Benz here. May I comment? Um, how about if we... Uh, have you uh, collect up your comments and then at the end, uh, perhaps uh, you can address them. Would that work for you? That will work for me. All right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Lang. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. This question is for planning. Um, Victor Benz suggested that a hydrologist, a professional, should be involved in this. And I'm just wondering when the 
province does give their recommendations, and I, I do agree with Councillor Swanson that we should be getting the recommendations from the province before we make any decisions. But does the province hire these hydrologists? I do believe they have professionals and stuff, but uh, not for, uh, on behalf of a municipality. I don't believe so. I don't know if you want to expand on that, uh, Keith. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, my name is Keith McRae, Director of Planning and Development. And uh, Jose has answered that question. I'll maybe expand just a little bit. Um, typically, when um, Clearwater County receives an application for the development or operation of a gravel pit, and um, this also applies to a gravel pit where they propose to mine below the water table, um, we review the application. We weigh it against our policies. We typically, if they are mining below the water table, we ask them to provide engineering documents. These are the same level of document that Alberta Environment will eventually want to review and to comment on um, when they're considering a Water Act approval. We would love it if the Alberta environment took a more active role when we are dealing with a review of a development permit application. In some cases where we push hard, um, they have become involved. Um, in this particular area, and uh, I would like to state that uh, the planning department and I believe council feels um, as strongly about this as the Alberta Fish and Game Association does. This is a remarkable area. This is an environmentally significant area. This is an area that is a very important recreation facility in central Alberta. And we too want to protect it. Um, we are satisfied at this point in time that our policies and our requirement to ask for detail from any proponent of a gravel pit is sufficient for this municipality to evaluate. And then we have the safety net of Alberta Environment, who also will review these documents and provide approvals uh, in regard to the Water Act. Um, that's all I have right now, thanks. All right, um, Councillor Duncan. Um. I don't know if Mr. Benz would know and staff may know, have there, are there any currently active gravel pits in this area that are below the, we're operating it as a wet pit? I don't. I can answer that. Okay, the, uh, go uh, ahead, the, Mr. Benz. Of the five quarter sections that are currently accessible to gravel operations, Four of them have above water table permitting only. The fifth is not permitted at all at this time. All right. Okay. Councillor Duncan, did you have a, another question? No, okay. <clears throat> Councillor Lang. Um, Mr. Benz, I understand that this, um, this area is perhaps more, um, sensitive due to the brown trout habitat. Um, can you just elaborate on that and what makes this area different than other below water table gravel operations? Certainly. Three elements are critical to the creation of this world-class trout fishery. Stable temperature, high clarity, and sustained flow rate. The North Raven River and Clear Creek are truly unique aqua systems due to the consistency in this water quality related to the groundwater springs forming the headwaters. Water temperature in particular is important. In the North Raven River, it is cool and stable throughout the year, ranging in the area of the headwaters between five and seven degrees year round. Trout are a cold water species. It's very common to see particularly brook trout clustered around the headwater springs where the water is the coolest. Brook, brook trout, one of the major trout species in the North Raven River, prefer a temperature range 
of 14 to 17 degrees centigrade. The lethal temperature is recorded as 25 degrees centigrade. The upper lethal temperature for developing eggs is listed as 12 degrees centigrade. Any significant temperature plume would immediately endanger any eggs laid near the headwater springs. Water quality, of course, clarity is another factor. Well-filtered water through the North Raven River is the result of being spring-fed via a permeable gravel aquifer. Finally, water flow rate. Bourneuf measures the North Raven River at about 34 cubic meters per minute. Only a few Alberta springs are larger, notably Moline Canyon. Miette Hot Springs and Banff Hot Springs are both several orders of magnitude smaller than the springs that sustain the North Raven River. All right, thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, Councillor Hoven. Uh, this one is for planning staff. Have there been any below water table gravel pits applied for and denied in this area? And what's the history on that? Because I believe it was four existing gravel pits all above the water table. Um, without the records in front of me, I'm going to test my memory. I, I believe that in this particular area, there have not been any applications thus far um, to mine under the water table. Um, we have had uh, one operator uh, approach us and uh, they actually went as far as holding an open house in the area. Their proposal was to take an existing pit, expand it, and also uh, get approval to mine below the water table. And, um, you know, they are aware that our policies will require them uh, to prove to us and also to Alberta Environment that uh, carrying out their operation would not adversely affect the environment, the groundwater, and the uh, quality of the, of the watershed in the, the North Raven area. Um, so, no, we have not had uh, any applications uh, submitted as of yet. Um, this group that was interested does not have an active application in front of us. Will they submit one? Uh, we think probably at some time once they're prepared, but we don't know for sure. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Go ahead. So if this group did come forward with an application, they would have to hire the hydrologist to prepare all the studies that we would ask for, correct? Yes. We have already identified that we would be requiring that information. They also are aware that Alberta Environment requires the same information. Okay. Now, if we, uh, Mr. Benz asked or said that for us to do a proper investigation of this application, that the county should hire a hydrologist to investigate this for the entire area. Um, do you have any idea what that cost would be? Um, like, I imagine there aren't just unemployed hydrologists looking for jobs right now. Well, We've, we've not looked into this, Councillor Hoven. Um, this is a very large area. Um, as Jose pointed out, I believe it's over 5,000 acres. Um, so no, we've not, uh, we've not investigated how much this would cost. Um, we would have to consult a professional, um, but uh, it, would be a, it would be a large project. And, and if I could add um, something uh, in that regard, and we also haven't identified this project as a priority, so we haven't budgeted for this at all. Okay. All right. Uh, one more, uh, Councillor Holman. Yes. Um, in regards to the landowners in the area, um, I know in your presentation, I think you said 75% are currently supportive of this, but none of those 75% are willing to sign their name to a form to say that. I, I guess that's, I, I totally understand the importance of protecting these environmentally sensitive areas. But I I'm, I'm guess I'm disappointed that the landowners who feel it's just as important are unwilling to, to sign something to say this is important to me. 
Uh, you know, they all mention that they're concerned about repercussions from neighbors and hurting relationships. And it, it feels like they want the county to just to come in and say it so everyone can be mad at the county instead of the neighbors. Um, what would it take, Mr. Benz, my question, what would it take for these 75% of landowners to come forward and say, we support this proposal? Uh, just uh, a minor correction, uh, Councillor Hovind, it was 73% that we had at the time we made the submission. However, uh, when we did put the proposal forward, we did approach the landowners again and ask whether they would be willing to send in letters and notices of support to planning and development. A number of them said that they would, but we had some disturbing conversations with a couple of them, most notably a, a couple that was very supportive in the initial go, made the statement, it's been strongly recommended to us, we do not get involved in this and did not want to talk about it any further. So there are some political forces at play, I'm not sure whose, uh, but that may explain one of the reasons that the landowners are concerned about how a public support formal public support of this may affect them in their dealings within the county and businesses within the county. Uh, I really can't answer what it would take for them to provide that support. We can certainly try to go back to them and see if we can get it, but just my initial sense of what happened when we were discussing with them initially, that would be a bit of a stretch. There were members who literally asked, where do I sign? But they were very definitely in the minority. Thank you. All right, are there any other questions or comments from uh, council? Uh, Councillor Lang. I guess I just wanna say that I am, I'm very concerned that if this application came forward and the proper studies weren't done, that it would um, destroy this um, unique fishing habitat in our province. And so my, I guess this question is to planning. Have you ever run across where there's been application for below gravel extraction where a hydrologist has not been required to do their investigation? And would, and I'm going to go one step further, and would it be possible if this application came forward that a hydrologist may not be involved? Um, just to answer your, try to answer your question, uh, Councillor, no, I haven't come across an application where, like uh, in this, of this nature, where, where an, uh, a hydrologist has, has been part of it. Um, and going back again to the, to the original uh, fundamental question is that we don't have an application yet. And they, so we are basically talking about something we don't have and we haven't reviewed yet. Um, and I believe that the industry will be responsible enough and the province will also require that a hydrologist be part of that, part of the team. If you wanna add something to that. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll add to what Jose has said. Uh, basically, short answer, Councillor Lang, is yes. We would require a hydrologist report. Our policies allow it. They encourage it in cases like this. And because uh, the county feels as strongly about this environmentally significant area and this fishery as Alberta Fish and Game does, um, absolutely. And the one proponent that has shown interest has already been told that that would be required. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, I see Councillor Hoven is, uh, has another comment or question. Uh, for Mr. Vance, with all the work that the province has done on this river in the last you know, 60, 70 years, do you know, does the province have this information that would be available uh, the information that we would want from a hydrologist report, is it available somewhere up in a filing cabinet up in Edmonton? 
I'm not sure exactly what uh, you're asking of me, but let me try to answer it this way, and then I will ask Dr. John Fennell if he has any comments. We have done a rather extensive literature search of concerns about uh, below water table gravel extraction and presented that field data to you and to all of the landowners in the area, including the gravel companies. We have specifically asked the gravel companies if they have any information to the contrary from their hydrogeologists, none has been forthcoming. Uh, from our perspective, we are describing the current state of science in this uh, region. We believe that it would be part of the information that would be considered by the government uh, of Alberta should an application get that far. John, any comments? Yes, sure. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, maybe provide a little bit of a background on the information that we did uh, access to, uh, to support our, our uh, position here. Um, when we pulled our report together, and I hope you had a chance to look at it, uh, we did reach into the you know, public domain uh, documents. Uh, we did manage to get access to um, um, another report that was very helpful. Uh, that was done actually on the springs in in uh, the North Raven River, uh, as well as uh, looking at some of the uh, some staff gauges and flow conditions. Um, so the some of the initial information was uh, based on a, a report by uh, Bourneff, I think it was back in 1980, early 1980s, looking at springs in Alberta, and uh, and the. Um, the uh, Leavitt Springs uh, were identified as, and the Stainbrook Springs were identified as springs of, of uh, natural exception uh, compared to other springs in Alberta, just because of their, uh, their source waters, which are actually sourced through a, a very large alluvial gravel system that connects up with the Clearwater River. So the, the water is actually originating from the Clearwater River and running towards the east, um, discharging into uh, the North Raven River and uh, and uh, um, springs like uh, Clear Clear Spring. This water is very very um, uh, very high quality. Uh, but what is interesting is is looking at some of the chemistry of this water. Uh, we were identifying certain constituents that were already uh, somewhat elevated in uh, in concentration. One of them in particular that caught my attention was chromium. And this is one of the concerns that we have with below water table gravel mining is that once you actually open up the, uh, the aquifer to the atmosphere, you can actually change its conditions. Uh, and this can facilitate the, the movement of certain things like chromium. Uh, and, when, and when the water becomes oxygenated by being exposed to the atmosphere, uh, chromium has an interesting way of shifting from trivalent to hexavalent chromium. And you, some of you may have heard of hexavalent chromium. Uh, that was the Aaron Brockovich uh, movie, but uh, it is a, it is a fairly uh, harmful to aquatic habitat. We're picking up um, concentrations of chromium in the groundwater right now, coming out of the springs that are above the uh, the guideline for freshwater aquatic life. So that's a concern that it's already there, that that would be exacerbated. On top of that, we um, identified some very good reports uh, that were done out in Ontario. Uh, down in Washington State, looking at very similar systems uh, where the below, um, below water table mining was actually agitating the water enough to have turbidity uh, high enough to be uh, transmitted up upwards of 1.8 kilometers. And this is hence the, the buffer zone that we're, uh, we're looking at here. Um, a lot of people, uh, contrary to popular belief, um, a lot of people think that, uh, a lot of professionals actually think that as, as this turbidity moves, it, it gets strained out. Well, it may, if, if the, uh, the, the, the grain size of the, of the aquifer is, is small enough, it may get strained out. But in this case, we've got a very permeable gravel as we've done, as we've identified through our calculations uh, and flow rates. I mean, we're, 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 you know, we're flowing at a very high rate. And so this turbidity has the potential to get to the North Raven River and cause some issues for spawning grounds and things like that. And I just want to make it clear 
the way this system works, it's not just springs that are feeding the North Raven River and Clear Creek. This is a, these are groundwater fed systems. So it is gaining water along the entire reach. The springs are distinct areas where the groundwater is coming out at surface, but the river itself is gaining base flow, which is what we call base flow uh, throughout the entire year from this aquifer. So understanding that is extremely important. On top of that, we have these issues of thermal plumes that can, that can move towards and discharge into these creeks and alter the thermal regime of the creeks. Um, and then if you wanna put climate change on top of that, as things get warmer, that just makes it that much more risky. So hopefully that provides a bit of context. All right, thank you, uh, Councillor Hoven. Any other additional comments or questions? I guess my, my comment is I wish I wish we had more information because I, I am completely on side with the Alberta Fishing Game Association that we need to protect these environmentally sensitive areas. The problem I feel is I don't have the information whether or not this proposal will do what it's intended to do. Um, what I, Councillor Holden, could I could I add one more uh, one more comment? I think you had a question about whether or not. Uh, this information, Alberta Environment holds this information in, in, in some, some place in their, in their operations. To be honest, uh, I don't believe that information exists. I don't, you know, Alberta Environment does not investigate all of the rivers in the province. They only do it if they have a reason to. Uh, the North Raven has not been a river that I know of that's been on their radar. They do have a water quality monitoring station downstream of this area. Um, I think, I can't remember the name of the highway 761 or something like that, but there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a station where they do take water quality measurements. I actually contacted their water quality branch to get access to that information. The only information that they had available was from the 1990s. They have not measured that since. Um, it was still useful information. Uh, the other information that we accessed was obviously more current, but it's not, something that's on their radar, which is a little bit disconcerting considering that this is such a unique and important um, uh, water body. Any I, other questions? My, well, my comment is I wish we had the information so we could make a clear decision on this. Um, a question for administration. Would environment, from your uh, years of experience, would environment and parks be open to jointly studying the area? Like, is there a grant application somewhere where we can investigate this? Because once this, once the damage is done, the damage is done. We can't go back. Do we know of anything like that? <clears throat> um, Councillor Hoven, I'm not aware of anything. That doesn't mean that there aren't avenues out there. Um, you know, I, I guess I just want to reiterate that um, we share the same level of, of uh, importance of this area. And, um, you know, testing the entire area would be ideal. It's also uh, going to be fairly expensive. We do have, and I, I think it's important that we don't overlook this, Anybody in this area that wants to propose a use that we feel is a threat to the environmentally significant area will be asked to do those studies. Um, the other thing I could suggest is council is going through a municipal development plan review at this time. Um, you know, maybe that is, well, not maybe, it is a tool that if council feels that this area has some differences and, and maybe a different level of, of need than the rest of the, the county, maybe you need to look at site-specific policies for this. Um, but to just based on this application without knowing whether the 30 plus landowners in this area are even supportive of a redesignation of their land might be a little bit premature. Thank you. All right, um, Councillor Duncan, I did see your light on for a moment. Yeah, just, I guess, brief comment. I, 
I think what Councillor Hovind is asking, some of the studies there is, is more of a research type that would be, you know, university-based or, or pure research. Uh, and I think Mr. Benz or Mr. Fennell both pointed out that to actually find out site-specific for this area requires an open pit gravel pit here to, to really find the true answer to those questions or else we have to base our conclusions could only be based on something that's happened elsewhere. We'd have to believe that that information would be ap applicable to our situation here. So I, I think at this time that's our, the avenues there. Like there are probably some things that could be done, but you know, in terms of left probably testing chromium or something like that. But, uh, and you know, there is some long-term monitoring that probably should be happening. I think that's a good point that those water quality monitoring stations, they have been, more of them developed in province, but I'm, I was not aware that they closed some of these ones and that's, or not using them as much as they used to. That's probably a, an issue that needs to be readdressed at some point by Alberta Environment as well. Um, I guess any other comments I would have are probably reserved to our uh, discussion on how we're gonna move forward on this. All right, uh, Councillor Lang. Okay. Um, I guess for me, um, I recognize that you know, site-specific data would likely be more effective way for determining zoning and uh, the requirements to ensure that we look after the, this important um, this important area in our community. Has your group uh, contacted uh, the depart uh, department in uh, the provincial government with regard to environment to express your concerns? Yes, we have. The immediately following the open house, we sent a letter to then read Mr. Duncan and to Mr. McRae, also to the Minister of Environment, Honorable Jason Nixon, uh, identifying our concern in this matter. Several members of individual groups affected by, potentially affected by a development like this, have also sent similar notifications to Minister Nixon. And uh, so they are very definitely aware of this issue and the concern around it. Were they able to provide you with a response at all, recognizing they do have a vested interest in the area with the hatchery? The response that we got from Mr. Minister Nixon essentially said that we declined to make comments about specific areas or specific projects because at some point in time we will likely have to rule on that from the perspective of the Water Act. And that, uh, other than being aware that this is an area of concern, we really didn't get much more of a response than that. All right, thank you for sharing that. Um, so I, I guess I'm looking to my council uh, and asking them how would we uh, like to proceed and unless there's any other comments that uh, yourselves would like to make before we get to that point. Have you got any other uh, concluding comments? Thank you very much, uh, Reeve Laird. Yes, I do. A couple of things have been raised. Uh, one of them was from a perspective of why now and reference to the Municipal Development Plan Review to which we've already provided our comments. Our concern is that that is a lengthier process and that a one or more of the gravel companies involved in this area may bring an application forward before that the impact of the Municipal Development Plan Review is finalized. Secondly, I understand the faith that uh, Director McCray places in Alberta environment, but our experience, both John's and mine, is a little different. One of the reasons that we're coming before you, Council, is Clearwater County is the only jurisdiction that actually asks the question, should this development go ahead? Should the county provide an approval for a development permit, the next step would be to go before Alberta Environment and Parks for a water license application. 
However, Alberta and Environment and Parks, in our experience, views the matter slightly differently. Because the company has an approved development permit in hand, they essentially approach it from the perspective, this development is approved, therefore our only role is to provide appropriate controls, restrictions, requirements that would allow this project to go ahead. We cannot see, based on the research that we've done, that this can be possible in any way, shape, or form. Finally, the reason that we've brought this forward, recognizing, as I've mentioned, that there are currently five, four gravel pits, identified gravel pits in the area, and a fifth that may be permitted, we have felt we had a choice of either taking on each one of these applications as they came forward, or to come up with an analysis such as we have to suggest below water table gravel extraction in this relatively small area of 33 quarter sections not be permitted by the county. Uh, that's basically our perspective on this matter is that we spent a fair bit of time putting our ducks in order to pre present this. The other comment that was made and uh, uh, Director McRae is correct, that they've county and other counties as well, so it's not just Clearwater County, has had difficulty in gaining access to the professional hydrogeologists that are in AEP for their opinion, particularly with respect to a potential development application. And the argument again is one of conflict of interest. I suggest that I'm, I'm not sure we need additional testing at this point in time. What I would like to suggest to council is that they request the planning and development group approach AEP and ask for their professional opinion on the app work that we have done and whether it is sufficient to justify the bylaw amendment that we're seeking. All right, um, thank you. Uh, it is, uh, gives us some more food for thought for sure. Um, I do have a question for uh, administration. If this uh, were denied for some reason today, is there a mechanism to reimburse um, some or all of uh, any of the fees that have had to be outlaid for this? Thank you, um, Griff. Um, currently, our policies stipulate that 50% will be returned to the, to the applicant if um, a public hearing is not held, but council can waive any fee requirements, if you wish. And we can refund the entire amount, if that's what you wish. All right, thank you for that clarity. All right, uh, Councillor Hoven. Uh, Victor, what was the motion you recommended? Could you repeat that, please? I recommend that Council ask the Planning and Development Group to contact Alberta Environment and Parks for their opinion on the quality of data that we've provided in support of this bylaw amendment and ask whether additional work needs to be done or whether they would support the amendment that we've put forward. I would like to move that. Okay, are there any questions with regard to that motion? Councillor Duncan. I, I guess for me, if, if we're doing that, then it, uh, it kind of puts a stop in the rest of this process because we're not, we're, we're gonna ask, we're, you know, we're asking if that data is, should we be considering it in, in terms of today's decision? And if, if we need an answer back from Alberta Environment Parks, that's really not possible at this time without our, you know, to move. Should we be making a decision on this application today without that data if we want it? Or without that answer if we want it? I, I would suggest not then. 
Suggest Actually. not to what part of that, Jim, just so I understand. I'm fine with, with asking Alberta Environment Parks for that answer, but if we're asking him for that answer, then we probably shouldn't be making a decision today on this because we we're considering that to be relevant to this case. Yes, I agree. So perhaps vote on the motion, then a motion to table this? That's what I was just going to say. I think that you're then exploring the option of tabling this item to get more information. So we can make an informed decision. That's, that's my if, understanding of what you're asking for. If I may add something, um, yes. with your permission, Please. but we're still missing the property owner's consent. Exactly. Go ahead. And I think the property owner's consent would be the next step after we get the information because I'm not interested moving forward if we do not have the informed consent of this council and also the informed consent of all the landowners in the area. I, I value private property and I do not think that we can just be limiting what people should be doing on their property without a grave, uh, without a grave reason to do so. Um, Councillor Duncan. Okay. Uh Sorry, I'll wait for Councillor okay. Lang. I'll come back Councillor to you. Councillor Lang. Uh, just further to uh, Councillor Hoven's uh, motion, I, I will be fully supporting that motion. But also, when we get these um, the answer back from Environment and Parks, not only will that inform us and educate us, it will educate the landowners and maybe where they're at right now in their thought process may change. So I guess, uh, oh, there we are, Councillor Duncan. Sorry. I was just collecting my thoughts on that. Um, I would agree with Councillor Lang on that. We went through, not really the, for the same purpose, but we've gone through uh, a bit of a similar process in terms of, of the ditching on the horse guard that occurred a number of years ago. And that's where the 80% came from, I believe. We, we asked for 80% there before that project could move forward. And uh, I think this is... Is, is one of the reasons why that's why that's applying. Um, there's a there's also a bunch of things in motion here that that are, I think are affecting this as well. One is the is the MDP review, and we are considering other ways to address gravel in that. The other one in play here is the province is currently reviewing the process for gravel applications and more in line for red tape reduction. But that is also in play here as well, and it, it may. Uh, may vote as well if we are asking them to comment on, on the information here as, as part of that process. Um, we are also, you know, we will be doing an LUB or a land use bylaw review down the road here in a year or two as well. Uh, and I, I think this, you know, I think we're gonna have to consider where we place this in that queue. Do we place it in the queue of the MDP review or the land use bylaw review? Um, I'm leaning more toward the land use bylaw review because that's what they're asking for here is a, is a change in the land use bylaw. We currently have the ability to protect below the water table. Um, we're reluctant, not reluctant to do it, but we are feeling a bit handcuffed by because we're asking the province for their opinion before we give approval for a gravel pit and they've so far refused to do that. They want our approval to go first. So that's something we have to resolve with them as well, I believe. Uh, but we have to date protected this area. There isn't anybody, minus, to the best of our knowledge, mining below the water table here. We did have one application, I believe it was at MPC, and I don't know if Councillor Hoven remembers this, but it was early in your term that I think we believe it was for a change in the development permit that they were, and it was kind of an application where they wanted a, a split development permit for above and below the water table, and we did deny the below the water table portion of that one. We ex accepted the above water table application, but did deny the below one. So we have been consistent over the years in, in my terms here to do that. So I, like I, think, I think tabling this would be, would be good, and it may be tabled all the way to the land use bylaw. We can lift it at any time we choose, or it may be tabled if we get information back that leads us to believe we are in a position to make a decision on this. Okay. 
Um, is there, uh, um, I guess for me, um, how administratively challenging is tabling this for staff? It will leave us a lot of homework to do, which is okay uh, from our end. Um, the challenge will be, or maybe the opportunity um, that we will have is that we're going through a, an MDP review. We are going through a land use by law review. So when is this, how is this going to fit within all these processes? We know that there is an interest to protect the land and we do have that interest to protect this environmentally significant land. So that's the challenge that I can see is where, how this is going to fit within all the work that we're doing at this point in time. Go ahead, um, Mr. McCray. We've learned it certainly uh, is a bit of a challenge. Uh, we're not adverse to taking on challenges. And uh, it is certainly something that we can investigate if that's council's desire. Mr. Benz and uh, Dr. Fennell, I'm hoping that you recognize as well that if this is the route we take, this will significantly change timelines for getting an answer. Uh, I, I hope you understand that as well. We fully understand that. I'm glad that council is considering our recommendation in this matter. I also want to emphasize that both Dr. John Fennell and I will be more than willing to participate with any Alberta Environment and Parks hydrogeologists that would be assigned to look at this. I certainly hope that they're amenable to having this discussion. I would be very concerned if they refuse to consider your request. All right, well, we uh, perhaps should have that motion read back to us. Uh, thank you, Reef Laird. Um, so what I have is that um, Councillor Hoven motion that Council uh, ask the Planning De and Development Department to contact Alberta Environment and Parks for their input and seek additional information on work required and gather feedback based on historical data. So uh, my understanding was that it was considered to be tabled to get that information. Is that uh, what you intended? The way I see it happening is we vote on this motion. If the motion passes, we can then have a motion to table this until we get that information. As long as that's a proper process. Councillor Lang. Um, maybe Councillor Hoven can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the motion was worded a little bit differently. And it was to ask Alberta Environment and Parks on whether the Alberta Fish and Games Association work is of quality and is valid. And if I am incorrect, Councillor Hoven, please correct me. I did no. not write my notes. I was, uh, I have faith that administration accurately copied what Mr. Benz had stated. At least the intent of what Victor Benz had stated. We're just letting administration catch up. All right, let's, let's try that again. Thank you, I apologize. Um, so I tried to write it kind of quickly, but I will confirm in the recording that it is accurate as to what he said before. It is um, complete. Um, I did add in there that, um, so to ask the Planning and Development Department to contact Alberta Environment and Parks um, for confirmation on the validity of um, the data acquired by Alberta Fish and Games Association. Does that seem more? Yeah. <laughs> um, for, um, and then did you want the um, input and seek additional information on required on work required and gather feedback based on historical data included in there as well. 
What was the second part? I think the, the first part was the most important one, but the okay. second part was? Um, um, for confirmation on their input and seek additional information on requi work required and gather feedback, by feedback based on their historical data. I'm, I'm good with them. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions or comments regarding that motion? I'm gonna call the question. One, may I speak, uh, Madam Chair? Um, we're just about to vote on this. <laughs> um, I, I know, the only thing I would like to add is that I was specifically requesting the opinion of professional hydrogeologists employed by AAP. Councillor Hoven, did you have a comment? If we could add that. We want accurate information. We don't want to base uh, a decision that's going to affect the lives of 33 different landowners on false or incorrect information. So yes, please add that. Is the remainder of the council comfortable with that change? Okay, they are. All right, I'm going to uh, ask the question. Those in favor? That is seven to zero, it is carried. All right, Councillor Hoven. We table, agenda item 4.1. Are there any questions or comments with regard to tabling item 4.1? Councillor Duncan. Just, just a comment that um, hoping to help administration out a bit and that, that they would have the opportunity to come back to us either during the MDP review or the land use bylaw review at any point and, and ask us if we would like to consider any, any or part of this as, as part of our, re during the review of the MDP. And we can, as a council, decide at that time if we want to, you know, put it, make, change anything in the MDP or consider it with a land use bylaw review. All right, is that uh, something that you would consider as a friendly amendment to your motion? It's not an amendment to the motion, it's just, just, just a comment. Just a comment, okay. I'm, I'm good. Any other questions uh, or comments? Seeing none, those in favor? That is carried seven to zero. All right. Um, I believe that concludes uh, this item for the time being. We'll look forward to uh, getting more information um, from the sources that we've uh, asked to have outlined. I, I think you can tell by virtue of our council that we are very sensitive to this area um, with the Raven River and Clear Springs and we are very much endeavoring to balance land, land stewardship and maintaining and honoring landowner rights, including ensuring their voice is able to be heard and any and all issues relating to their lands. So it's going to be important moving forward that we ensure that happens as this process continues. Um, thank you again for uh, your information uh, and thank you to staff for putting this together on our behalf. All right, we're going to take a 10 minute recess.
Okay, so we're back from our recess. It is 10.20. We're moving on to item 5.1 on the agenda. And it's with regard to a letter of support with regard to broadband grant application. Mr. Hagan. Thank you, Reeve Laird. Council will find attached to the agenda item a letter from Lightlink Technologies requesting a letter of support from the county in regard to their application under the Universal Broadband Fund grant. Uh, administration has drafted the attached letter of support uh, for Council's consideration. While Clearwater County is intending to apply under this granting program as well, we believe that any grants that a local ISP or another ISP, for that matter, any ISP, offering services in the county might be successful in obtaining would complement the current approved backbone project and see improved broadband services to, uh, to the areas of the county. All right, thank you. Um, any questions or comments from council? Uh, Councillor Swanson. Yes, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Hagan. I, I fully agree with you. The fact that um, our our infrastructure will support uh, the independent con contractors on on what we are proposing. Um, I guess in my research and stuff, I think we we as council need to be cautioned though that we uh, don't take. Uh, that we, we provide letters of support or um, provide same or equal treatment to all our service providers. Because um, at some point, I know it's been said in, in past discussions that, uh, you know, the competitors will can take discriminatory issues to the CRTC, whether they're factual or perceived, and can cause us significant delays or disrupt our service. So just we have to make sure that we are... Uh, fair and equitable with, uh, with all our service providers uh, in our area. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Lang. Yeah, I just want to say I fully agree with uh, Murray Higgins and Councillor um, Swanson's comments. Um, and I, I will be happy to uh, make the motion uh, for council to um, um, accept this letter of support for uh, Lightlink, and um, I, but I do have one question. I'm just wondering, has the county got in their application yet, Mr. Hagen? Thank you. Uh, the county will be working on that application. Um, starting right away, we awarded the contract for engineering services for the backbone project um, just in the last few days. And so we'll be working with the engineers and that will be the first task on their list is to apply particularly on uh, the more immediate uh, fund with the, um, the rapid response opportunity where the deadline is January 15th. So that'll be our first order of priority. And then we'll be shifting them to the regular stream applications that are due middle of February as well. All right, thank you. Any other questions or comments from council? Seeing none. Oh, Councillor Hoven. When we had the consultants in for the workshop and they explained how the granting is provided, um, Hopefully you can refresh my memory. They, each geographic area was marked whether or not it has what level of internet access it has. So if Lightlink does get the grant and does put fiber to the home for a few air, for additional homes in Fairway, I don't know how many homes are asking for, how big of a geographical area does that limit, does that take out of uh, the federal government's view for other funding? Do you happen to know that, Mr. Hagan? It's, it's a big question. I'd like to give you a big answer. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, though, it, it's probably going to come down to the funding amounts as well. 
as the geographic area. So that would be within the purview of the federal government granting agency that, that is going to be reviewing and approving these applications. So honestly, I, I can't give you a definitive answer on that. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll ask the question. Those in favor? That is seven to zero, that is carried. Thank you, Mr. Hagan. We are moving on to item 5.2. Um, this will be a bit of a departure from our normal uh, process, but uh, we'll start with Mr. Emmons. Thank you, Reeve Laird. Um, if I may, I will present this agenda and then turn the floor over to Deputy Reeve Vandermeer for any questions and expansions. Uh, staff recommendation. This agenda was not prepared or written by staff, therefore no recommendation was able to be provided. The background, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer wrote and requested this item come before council for discussion and possible motions. So the item, fiber to the premise applications under the recently announced federal universal broadband fund. So Deputy Reeve Vandermeer's recommendations before council today for consideration. The first one, that council approves the engineering of countywide fiber to the premise. The second, that council approves the preparation and submission of three applications to the June, January 15th Universal Broadband Fund intake deadline for fiber construction projects. Successful grant applications would be constructed and become operational during 2021. The projects to be submitted are Rocky to Nordegg Bighorn, Rocky to Racinus, and Ferrier through Crimson Lake area. All of these projects would include the backbone extensions and fiber to as many premises as can be accommodated within the $5 million maximum project size. The third motion, the council approves the purchase of backbone, approximately 200 kilometers plus, and fiber to the premise, 400 kilometers plus, for two plus years of construction. The fourth motion, that a communications plan be prepared to explain the revisions to the back broadband rollout. And the fifth motion, that the backbone build to old be postponed in favor of the fiber and backbone build to Racinus with the related fiber to the premise. The projects being considered today are the direct result of recent announcements by the federal government, which are recognizing the importance of making fiber available to as many homes and businesses as possible. The federal government is providing funding up to 75% for projects in underserved areas of Canada. Clearwater County was recently assessed at, as 95% underserved. The federal funding has been increasing in recent years and is expected to continue for five or more years. Clearwater County will continue to budget fiber projects as the grants continue to be made available. And Deputy Mayor Vandermeer summarizes this. This federal support is a game changer. It is expected to enable much better internet service for residences in rural areas of Canada. It has caused us to pivot to take advantage of additional funding. We will work with other municipalities indigenous communities and communication industries to enhance our applications and customer services. Great, thank you for reviewing that. Um, and again, uh, recognizing that we do have a full agenda, um, I'm hoping that we can curtail ourselves uh, to not create uh, a long day, uh, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. So I'm hoping 15 or 20 minutes that I had allowed the last group will work for you as well. Thank you very much, uh, Reeve Laird. Uh, let me just emphasize again that the normal approach uh, to this would have been to provide a notice of motion, probably at this meeting, and uh, make the motions at the next regular meeting, which would be January 12th. The problem with that, and the reason we're talking about it today, 
is that the intake for the rapid response uh, program is of course January 15th. So obviously, if we really got started on January the 12th, that isn't gonna work. So, so what I'm hoping is that we can provide uh, additional clarity and uh, direction today so that we can expedite. So uh, I would also mention that, that uh, I've invited uh, with uh, Council's permission, uh, Reeve Laird, uh, Mr. Swanson from Missing Link, who is a local ISP and has uh, some firsthand information on dealing under this program and other experiences uh, with, uh, with fiber to the home in the area. So uh, with your permission, we could invite him to. Well, I, I will ask the council, uh, are we in favor of having uh, a delegation on behalf of uh, Reeve Vandermeer provide uh, additional information to his, uh, his presentation? Councillor Hoven. What additional information is this delegation going to be bringing? That's my first question. The program was announced, the UBF, uh, well, in the application it says it was the recently announced Federal Universal Broadband Fund. That is incorrect. The Universal Broadband Fund was announced in budget 2019, so over a year and a half ago already. The only change that was recently announced was $600 million going to Telsat so they can have some, uh, make some competition to compete against Starlink and then $150 million for the rapid response program which is for shovel ready projects. Um, so what information are we hoping to learn from this delegation? Well it's Deputy Reed Vandermeer and then I think we'll have to have a vote on yeah. whether we're going to allow this. Yes it's uh, it's to uh, clearly to uh, talk about the rapid response program uh, experience with it and experience with uh, fiber to the premise in the general area and there's a there's a key issue here uh, for us to respond to this uh, one of the questions the questions relate around engineering capacities and particularly construction capacities uh, if you uh, start adding uh, additional works uh, how can that be managed is it reasonable to expect it to happen and this is uh, local expertise in that regard all right. Is is missing? Is, is the delegation going to be in any way one of the groups that benefits? Should we approve this? Because if they will benefit, that could be a conflict. Um, no, I don't believe they would be uh, in conflict on this at all. I actually think we need to ask administration through this process, we would need to do an RFP process. If this were to be approved, we would need to do an RFP process. And having a, this delegation come in, is there a potential that that would limit their ability to then make application to, or through, for involving themselves in the RFP process? Because I don't want to inadvertently do that to an organization or a company either. Uh, Mr. Emmons. Yes, thank you, uh, Reeve Laird. Um, yes, it would. Um, given the dollar value in this project, it would be against legislation uh, to pick. It would have to be tendered out at a minimum, an RFP. Um, so it would directly hinge on the level of detail that would be presented by this delegation and of course uh, whether or not they even intend upon uh, going after the RFP or the tender. All right, um, Mr. Hoven, you're... Uh, no. Okay. Deputy Reeve Vandermeer, uh, do you need a moment to have that conversation with this, uh, with this person? Prior to deciding, I think that person uh, and company need to have that opportunity to have that discussion. Let me quickly. Okay, we're going to take a five minute break.
All right, thank you. We had a brief recess. So we have half of the question. Uh, Councillor Vandermeer, uh, your uh, presenter is uh, comfortable with uh, the limitations that may be imposed? Yes. Okay, the next part of this question then is to, uh, I'm going to ask this council to vote on your comfort level and if you want to have that presenter present. Does everybody understand what's being asked? Okay, and it needs to be two thirds, my understanding. Okay, those in favor? That is five, those opposed? To two. So yes, you may present. Oops. Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to present Mr. Phil Swanson of uh, Missing Link uh, ISP. Uh, he has done previous work in, uh, and has uh, activity in Clearwater County and other central Alberta municipalities. Um, should we introduce our I believe we should. Let's do that. Our council. Councillor Duncan. Good morning. Jim Duncan, Division 1, southwest of Rocky. Uh, good morning. Daryl Ahid, uh, Division 3, and that's East Central. John Vandermeer, we know each other. Jimmy Laird, Councillor for Division 2 in Reeve, and it's the area that uh, is east of Rocky, uh, straddling Highway 598. Hmm. Good morning, Teresa Lang, Division 5, and that surrounds Rocky Mountain House through to the West Country. Tim Hoven, Division 6. Michelle Swanson, Division 7. Good morning, Murray Hagen, Director of Corporate Services. Rick Emmons, CEO. All right, uh, Mr. Swanson. Yeah, my Phil Swanson from Missing Link Internet. Um, I'm but I'm just in for just a little bit of discussion on my experience with grant programs and stuff. I will try not to be specific on anything with it unless requested on something, so. Yeah. Yes, I wanted to ensure that yes. we didn't inadvertently disqualify yes. you in some way. Um, I will try to tread very lightly with that. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. Okay, th thank you. Um, the, uh, I guess specifically uh, what I would ask Mr. Swanson to comment on is his experience with the UBF and the rapid response uh, supplement or addition to that and um, any general comments you have on fiber to the premise which I know you have a fair amount of experience in. Could you offer a few comments? Um, <clears throat> is when we, with regards to the grant and stuff, there is the two programs, the UBF and the RRBS, uh, or not RRBS, the rapid response. It, the rapid response is for programs that are, what I've, from what I've understood from talking with Mike Bossy, the director of the program, he has mentioned that it is programs that are ready to go. So with permits in place and they need to be built and in production by November of next year. So um, that is, it's definitely a large ask to, to do all of this. Um, I also do, I've also talked with him too about uh, as far as redundant building and going to areas that are already labeled on the maps. Um, <clears throat> so I do agree that John is correct in saying maybe you are better to take away the, the from Caroline to Olds portion of your current program, because that would be a redundant one, which I, my feeling would be not covered in the grant. That money would be, I think, benef more beneficial for your county and, and constituents to take that money to getting to fiber to the home 
in all these areas as well too on it. Um, and that it would be eligible for grant funding too. So you're at least getting money ahead on your funding with it that way. Yeah. That's, uh, and it, I mean, the rapid response, it depends really on how quickly you can get all your stuff together for that, if you can get it all put together for uh, January. It is a, I've also talked to him about that as well too. It is a, what he quote said was a first come first serve grant program. So the sooner to get the grants in, the better on that part of it. Um, what he also did finish saying, he said he would love to see the whole program get used up because then he will go back to Minister Monsef and say, hey, look what a success. I want more money. Let's continue this program and expand on it. So that's nothing on that is in paper. That is just something he told me on that. So. Okay, uh, thank you on that. Uh, there was one other important aspect uh, that I think you probably have uh, background experience in, that is contractors in the area. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we had a program out here west of Rocky Mountain House, and one of the contractors there comes from outside the province. And uh, could you offer us any comments on what you see as the availability of contractors within Alberta and perhaps specifically central Alberta? Um, what I found in, in our area, like we have done a few projects and stuff, and uh, what's happening now is a lot of the pipeline companies are sort of retrofitting their design and focus of business into what is becoming the opportunity of putting fiber in the ground. So there is a lot of local experience that is very available to, to build these projects and are ready to go. I have companies knocking on our door all the time saying, hey, are we ready to go? Can we commit to this and stuff on it that way? So, um, so there, is, there is a lot of local, local experience and, and good quality people that have been doing pipeline, which is very similar to putting fiber in the ground as well too. So. Just before you move on, I actually would like to ask uh, administration, and I do see that um, Mr. Emmons uh, uh, has an, a question or a comment, but my question or, or comment to administration is, could you please take a moment to outline the expectations and regulations around RFPs and how they have to be uh, tendered, because I know there are some regulations and expectations. If you wouldn't mind uh, adding that to whatever comment mm -hmm. you'd like to make, Mr. Emmons. Thank you, Reeve Laird. Yes, uh, Clearwater County as a municipality is governed by legislation as every other municipality in all of Alberta. Um, we totally agree there is well-qualified local individuals here capable um, they just need to compete as per legislation uh, the west trade agreement requires it um, this would well exceed one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars i would propose uh, which is legislation uh, so we hope uh, that we see local people working through this project because uh, not only uh, do we believe that broadband in our community is essential for community growth, uh, let alone sustainability, but in the interim to see local people working would be fantastic for any municipality. We have no control over how individuals bid or how competitive they choose to be. And thank you. Uh, just to clarify, Mr. Emmons, the West Trade Agreement ensures that we have to advertise much further than our borders, does it not? Canada-wide. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. Deputy yes. Reeve Vandermeer. Yes, thank you uh, for that uh, clarification. And uh, the last question I had, and, and after this question, I'll turn it over to my fellow councillors. They may have further questions. But uh, Mr. Swanson, um, What's your experience? You've had a fair amount of, uh, of, of experience putting fiber to the premise in your area and you've watched some others. What happens when county uh, uh, run pro projects or county combined with ISPs 
uh, develop a project going by the uh, residential subdivisions that you're familiar with? Generally, generally speaking, I would say like if going through a fairly populated residential area, our experience, how we have done it is we have a, a set fee for the customer to hook up onto our network and stuff and going forward with that. So I would say generally we're about a 60% uptake in the areas of, of a higher denser population. Um, once you get into the more rural areas, it is a little bit less because the expense, uh, the extra expense of going the to people's homes is like if you're a quarter mile off the road, there's it's obviously a lot more expensive than hooking someone up that's 50 meters off the road with it that way. So that percentage would be a little bit would definitely be a bit lower on it because of the costs on it. Um, the way that I'm understanding that this may work with the county is that you will be building it to the home. So I would say those percentages will be much higher than that because quite honestly, if you're able to get internet to your home, fiber to your home at no cost, that it would be crazy to say no to it <laughs> on it. So I would say your percentages should be very high. Councillor Swanson. Just for clarification, the motion that council has passed is not fiber to the home right now, it is for a fiber optic backbone. Thank you for clarifying. Yep. This project like the UBF is eligible for that. So, so that's what I was understanding that that's where maybe there's a pivot point to swing your, to in, expand what you're ex already doing. For, for sure, we have uh, much to consider and deliberate on. Um, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, uh, I, Councillor I'll, Duncan. Yeah, I'll turn I... it to whoever. Okay. Just, ask just a question. Uh, I just need clarification. If a line is built from here to Olds, does that, as a backbone line, does that affect the ability of us to secure grants for fiber to the home off of that line or future? Grants is that I don't know if that's one for if anybody can answer that at the present time. Um, you don't. You don't. Sorry. With the area, if we have a backbone line going down Highway 22 to Caroline, would that change the area from being underserved to being served and affect our ability to apply for a grant? Well, I, I would suggest that as soon as you hook something to that and provide some well, a point of service along that you will disqualify a significant area. And that's why I would suggest that uh, if you want to get an area uh, fibered up, put in a combination of backbone and fiber for the entire area that, that you would uh, traverse. And in the case of, uh, of the backbone to Caroline, because there isn't any there, I think it stands a good chance of inclusion. Whereas anything past Caroline, all the way to Olds, you're paralleling existing fiber and there's no chance of getting a grant. That's the way it appears at this time. Okay, um, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. Um, any, any other, uh, ask if there's any other questions that uh, council may have for our guest? Well, I guess my question is, uh, just building on what Councillor Duncan indicated. So perhaps I need to walk over, at least in my mind, this core backbone change and negating any potential grants. I, I don't quite understand where you're, uh, where you're making that distinction of we wouldn't qualify for a grant. I'm saying that anything past uh, past Caroline or Racina, somewhere in there, would not qualify for a grant because you're paralleling existing fiber. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Uh, all right, um, Councillor Duncan. And I, I think just to me further or to clarify as well that if if the backbone was between here and Caroline, which is underserved but somebody put a tower up and started servicing that area, it would no longer be considered underserved and then any future fiber to the home in that area would not qualify as well. That's correct, 
to my understanding. So, so that th there again, the urgency of making a uh, combined comprehensive application, getting it on the record, even if you, even if you don't make the rapid uh, response um, uh, funding, if they extend it, if they extend the rapid response time and funding, uh, it'll be there and uh, be in the queue for consideration. Or if it goes into the next uh, group in February 15th, it's still there. It's recording it this time, I think, is very important. Um, Councillor Hoven. Oh, I didn't know my light was on. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I don't have any questions for our, uh, our, our delegation, but I do have some bigger comments getting back to the motion. So I will wait till all the questions of the uh, delegation are done. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lang. Um, Phil, in your experience uh, in Lane Fiber, would you say... What, I guess my question is, what is more efficient use of dollars? Putting the backbone out and coming back and going to the premises after the fact or building an area out one area at a time? I think the most efficient way is by doing them both together. So you do have a backbone that you build, but you also have your fiber to the premise built in with that as well too because the ma main expense of building is the actual labor of getting this stuff in the ground so so if you can combine the two of them together you're getting the best bang for your dollar really all right uh councillor laheed i i guess my my question has more to deal with the level of engineering work you look at for uh, maybe if you could just comment on the engineering from say um, the backbone to a distribution system to the fiber to the premises and how much engineering work you see has to be done in order to come up with a plan. <laughs> that's, that's a big one because <laughs> there are so many different ways and designs to build a network and stuff that way. Um, my, my design may be different than someone else's too. Um, that obviously would become an RFP question on, with that end of it. So um, we can spend hours discussing that one so I, I will refrain on that <laughs> all right and, and I appreciate that because I, mm -hmm. I worry that uh, we don't want to inadvertently disqualify no. you from a future yes. RFP <laughs> I see that we have Mr. Hagen and Mr. Emmons mm -hmm. oh um, and uh, I do have a question now for the delegation okay I, I think that Mr. Hagen and Mr. Emmons might have had something they wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you, Reeve Thank you, Councillor Hoban. Um, just wanted to suggest to Council that the leg or phase down to old is part of the approved project currently. Mm -hmm. And that portion of the overall backbone project is not dependent on the UBF funding to succeed. And I would suggest further that if it would make us ineligible, which I'm not sure it will or not at this point, even if it made that phase ineligible for the UBF funding, I suggest there are other good reasons to continue that like duels um, outside of that. So just for council's consideration. Thank you for clarity. I recognize there's other circumstances that we need to consider as well. Um, Councillor Hoven, thank you for your patience. So do you have any homes, any customers connected to your network by fiber at this point? Oh, yes. How yeah. many? Uh, we just added on another 160 around Sylvan Lake right now. So around Sylvan Lake? Around Sylvan Lake, we have Benelto as well, uh, probably about 40, 50 there. Um, in Eckville, we have probably 20 that are on actual fiber um, and probably another 40 more that are through wireless that are well over 50 and 10 services. Okay, so how do you decide where fiber goes? Um, generally speaking, it's kind of the community that winds up coming to us first and asking, 
like and and requests that we go in and and go like because we do have cover a large area in wireless so when we see the demand for fiber in a community then that's where we would look at the project and and to actually just put it all in on our own dime i would say is not always feasible but with these grants that are out there we we well we have applied for quite a few already is and there a, a certain density of homes or potential customers that you look at before you consider putting fiber i would say like to it really changes depending on how many pops like the pops is what starts adding up like where you start paying your expenses to hook up to all these different areas so if you can tie a few of them in together through a backbone like which you guys are trying to do then that saves saves money in the long run by doing that for their customers okay so the, so the pops the cost of the pops is totally dependent on whether or not we control the back right if you hook up in a community you're still going to have that fixed expense of connecting say to Axia for 40 people or 400 people, you're still going to have that expense. So if, if you're only going to hook up four or five people on it, it really, the math is pretty hard to make it work. So how big of an area, how long distance would you look at to hook up four or five people then? Four or five people per block, per mile? In a block for sure would be, would make sense. So if you're in a community of 40, 40, 50 people and you can hook up and get say 60 70 percent to that i would say that makes sense okay thank you councillor duncan uh, i'm just wondering if anybody knows what level of engineering you need in terms of fiber to the home to to do the grant applications is it how significant is the work or the detail required on that i would say you don't i don't have a degree in engineering and we've been successful on quite a few grants already so I mean, it's not mandatory to have an engineering degree in it, but uh, you definitely have to have an understanding of how it works and stuff to, to put your plan in. But, but they don't need to know on the grant application, you know, how many homes you're going to. You don't have to have yes, any. Yes, that is do. definitely in the grant application. They, on um, this grant application, basically you make a circle, you draw where you want to cover, um, and the government has a program in there that will take data from that and to say okay well you have 35 people that are already 50 and 10 this area is ineligible or you circle it and it says that there's 400 people that are eligible and you have nobody on 50 and 10 this area is eligible but you don't have to do you have to give them an estimate of like 60 percent sign up rate or not they are not asking for that no they're not just that. for the, the you ones do have that to qualify for it yes uh, you do have to prove that it is a viable project like so continuing forward that the government obviously isn't going to have to keep throwing money at it to keep it afloat so you do have to prove that it is a viable program okay. so a business case for it. yeah you have to make a business case for it, yes all right um recognizing that uh we don't want to keep Mr. Swanson here too much longer, and I thank you for your uh, assistance. Councillor Lang? I don't know if this is a valid question or if you should answer it, so if you should, because I don't want to uh, destroy any chances of you applying for an application. We're going to be looking at an open access policy for ISPs. Is there any recommendations or thing or? Um. My, my opinion would be that an open access would have to be open access all the way to the home to make it a fair, uh, make it a fair program for anybody to access it. Um, if there's one, if one company owns the actual fiber to the home, I, in my opinion, they own that customer forever. So the only way to make it open access across the whole board is by actually going to each premise. Sorry? Suggest, sorry. Oh. You're suggesting that the county go to each premise to make it truly open access. To make it truly open access all the way to the home, to make it still a competitive market, it almost has to be owned completely by you guys to go right to the home. Thank you. All right. Um, are there any other questions for Mr. Swanson? Um, 
or um, Deputy Reeve uh, Vandermeer before we get to each of these motions. Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. I, I think that that does cover it and uh, um, I, I guess the other thing about you know that there's two or three proposals here what I've suggested I've previously sent uh, uh, a few notes and uh, a little sketch even to each councillor and there are two there are two pro projects in particular the one uh, Rocky Mountain House to Nordegg, where no fiber currently exists. And the other one, as mentioned, Rocky Mountain House to uh, west of Caroline, where there is a pot at this point in time to tie in for, uh, to complete the loop and, and get redundancy if, if that's attractive to anyone. Those two routes should be eligible if combined with uh, fiber to the premise along those routes, and in the case of going to Nordegg, along the route doesn't amount to much. It's the end uh, community that is the attraction there, combined with the fact that there's an indigenous uh, community a little further. So those two programs would be, in, in my view, very highly, should be very highly recommended to pursue as combined fiber and fiber to the fiber backbone and fiber to the premise. Try to get the grants. Because if we get the grants, suddenly these $5 million projects become 1.25 million, or we, we could increase the chances of being approved by uh, funding them greater than the 25% from our side. And that could be considered, but we have time to make that kind of a decision into early January. So what's important now is to uh, make a decision as to putting the engineering in place so that we can make the applications and, uh, and getting them in. The, I guess the other point I'd make by taking a look simply at the one going to Racinus uh, you're talking about quite a number of residents along that route. And, uh, you know, rather than spending all the money on uh, the backbone, if that money goes into tying in the residences with leverage, you would be getting a significant amount of income. You could uh, be getting something over 400 residences along that route. There's uh, 400 residences uh, in the Farrier um, uh, Crimson Lake area as well, and maybe a couple hundred towards Nordegg. And one 10 gig connection out of Rocky Mountain House or out of, out of uh, Racinus uh, costs in the order of 36 or $40,000. And that's all the money you have to put in to connect everything we could connect in the county in probably two years. As long as we're under a couple of thousand connections, uh, we can do it with a 10 gig connection. That's only $36,000. So I'm saying that that's a better short-term investment. You can make the decision to build to uh, Olds at a later date and try, try, for the, uh, try for the grant at this point in time. So that's, that's the synopsis of uh, or the, the strategy I'm suggesting here. All right. Um, Questions on that? Before we get to that, is um, is the, your requirement to uh, have um, Mr. Swanson uh, stay here uh, still in place, or should we well, allow Mr. Swanson to? He can he can uh, take his leave at his pleasure. Okay, I just didn't want to tie as, you as up. As long as we're not uh, as long as we're not infringing on his time, I don't mind him staying. To, Okay, thank you. All right, um, perhaps the best way forward, uh, given that we have a number of um, recommendations to make motions on, perhaps we do them one at a time and discuss them. Will that uh, strategy uh, work for you, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer? Yes, that's fine. I, I, would, uh, I would invite discussion on the first proposal here just to uh, identify 
the positives and the concerns uh, before we make the actual motion. Well, there's quite a gamut here. That's why I asked about if we can use the strategy of one at a time. Yes, one at a time. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so your first motion uh, reads that council approves the engineering of countywide fiber to the premise. Is that uh, how I understand it? Yes, and just to speak to that specific one, uh, clearly if we were to uh, do the western side here, we're picking up a lot of the uh, residents on the west side of the Clearwater River as we were, we'd be going south. That is a segment of the county. It's also uh, one of the most underserved and the most difficult to serve because of all the trees. Some valleys in there, but particularly the tree coverage makes it a problem to serve. And that's why fiber becomes much more uh, important in that area. And uh, if we were to get the engineering or confirm that the engineering gets done immediately on that area together with uh, uh, um, Nordegg and area, and uh, as, as need be, I think there's a lot of engineering work that's already been done in the Farrier and other areas. That may not be so significant, but to confirm that the engineering gets done on that immediately. And then, because there's another round of, of input February 15th, my suggestion is since 95% of the county is underserved, that by February 15th, we apply for the rest of the county. And again, the engineering would be generic. You'd have to lay it out and confirm the, uh, the, where, where the uh, uh, backbone and main rib structures were. But you might as well apply for the whole thing uh, for the rest of the county and then just have that in place and see how the funding comes, given that 95% is underserved. All right. So are, are there any... Oh, Councillor Duncan. So a, a question that, but the February 15th grant is still a $5 million maximum? No, no, it isn't. And that's, that's another thing that as we go further, the projects could be, get bigger. And as you're aware, uh, I am the chair of a, uh, uh, of a task force at CAPE. So the CAPE organization will be looking to find a project that is multi-municipality in nature, somewhere between uh, the task on the north and Olds on the south, and everything west and somewhat east to see if there's a project. And that's where, again, the leg from Caroline to Olds goes through multiple municipalities, and I would suggest that that work should be done. It would probably not be able to be put together until the 2022 time frame, but I think it's worthwhile trying to get the multiple municipalities together to strengthen the application and give it a chance of, of getting broader project funding. Right. So, again, the motion uh, that Deputy Reeve Vandermeer is putting forward is that Council approves the engineering of countywide fiber to the premise. Does everybody understand the question? Um, Councillor Duncan. I guess, again, looking for clarification, we have made a, a motion already, have we not, for that? For, I don't know if we have. So uh, again, we're working without uh, staff having had opportunity to gather this information on our behalf. So we'd be asking staff to, on the fly, look up past uh, motions. Councillor Swanson. Yes, I looked up uh, an inventory of motions, you could say. And what we have passed uh, was uh, back in... August of 20, 25th of 2020. Motion by Councillor Swanson, the Council approves the core backbone project. Phase one, Rocky Mountain House to Farrier. Phase two, Rocky Mountain House to Caroline via 20, Highway 22, Range Road 54 to Sundry to Olds. Phase three, Rocky Mountain House to Condor via Highway 11, Range Road 42 to Highway 22 and Junction 12. Phase four, Highway 22 to Junction uh, 12, sorry, Highway 22 and and 12, junction to Brazo, 
Wetaskiwin County border, phase five, ferry acre subdivision to Nordegg, phase six, uh, highway 22 to 12, and 12, sorry, junction to Lacombe County border and highway uh, T61, subject to commence at various years as provincial and fund granting comes available and as per council's budget priorities carried. And to add to that, um, no, we have not discussed fiber to the premises. We have only discussed the core backbone and that is only what we have approved. Councillor Duncan? Just, yeah, trying to straighten it out. Um, we have given staff direction to apply for the UVF grants, have we not? And that requires that engineering? Or, I, to be clear, most of these conversations have happened in workshops. Okay. Yes. To be equally clear, this is quite frankly, the most public conversation we're having about county broadband that we've had in number of years that we've been working on this. Um, so to have a, a inventory of motions provided by a councillor, I thank you councillor Swanson for your efforts. I think it's important that as we move forward that we get it validated by our administration. I think that that will be important for us. And I think it'll be important for our community to understand the magnitude of this project. Um, everybody's got their light on, so I'm gonna just work our way through. Um, Councillor Hoven. In regards to motion number one, the council approves the engineering of countywide fiber to the premise. It was two years ago we sat in this very room when we had Jennifer Massig and Magna Engineering here and as we discussed this proposal in that workshop, I think every one of us around this table said fiber to the home is the way to go. And then we looked at the numbers and realized that that is absolutely impossible to do. We just have word today that if you have four to five homes in a block, well then fiber kind of makes sense. And we are talking about a limited number of homes on over, I believe it was 400 kilometers. There's, there's no way the numbers ever work. Even if you have the federal government throwing millions and millions and millions of dollars in. And the biggest problem that we are gonna face if we approve this motion is we're gonna have a hodgepodge of a little fiber here, a little fiber there, a little fiber there, gonna be disconnected, and our operational cost to maintain that little fiber to the home network is gonna be astronomical per user. What we are voting on today is not just to pivot from our backbone plan that was approved, that we went out to the public, we did public consultation, we got information and then we approved that backbone plan, seven to zero I might add. This is not just a pivot from that plan, this is a completely new direction, or I should say old direction, to a plan that two years ago, everyone around this table decided we cannot afford to go forward with. I'm gonna call it the zombie broadband plan because it died two years ago and now it's back like out of some bizarre nightmare. The county cannot afford this. And we have the numbers in a business plan that was in a closed session so it's not public information and we can't even talk about how bad the numbers are. So the fact that we are reconsidering this is bizarre to me. There has been nothing in the last two years that make this plan better. The UBF is an old, it is an old fund from 2019 the only changes, like I mentioned earlier, are money going to TELSAT and $150 million for this rapid response, of which we have no projects that are ready for that. I looked at the calendar. If we were to approve motion, if we were to find something to do the rapid response, we've got 12 business days for our staff to prepare. Now they're good, but they're not that good. We cannot afford to do a pivot. 
We cannot go and tell our public, we came to you a few months ago with this plan, but then after 30 minutes of public discussion, we're flipping and we're going back to this other plan and you have no, no chance to voice your opposition to it. You don't have a chance to see the numbers and the financial costs. This, this is just a bad plan. And we cannot go back, rehash this thing to death. We have a current motion for a slow plan, a slow and steady plan that's going to be working with ISPs. It's going to be working with different community groups to get internet out to people in a cost, in a way that we can afford the costs. We can even afford to do it if we don't get a single grant. But what we're doing, we're going to take that good plan, throw it out, and then gamble that we can get money from the federal government to serve a small number. Like, there's no way this is a good plan. I could go on for hours with how bad of a plan this is. Well, I thank you, Mr. Hoven, for not doing, uh, uh, Councillor Hoven, for not going on for hours, but we recognize uh, uh, some of the challenges we're having to be faced with in this decision today, and I, I value um, your passion. Councillor Lang. Gosh, I don't know how I go up against that. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different take on this. In the long run, fiber to the home makes the most sense. It's going to be the less, co less cost. We've heard, we've heard that over and over again. We've heard how spectrum is going to change and it's going to go to 5G and 5.6 and how that won't work in the rural areas. Two years ago, um, I, I, I was for moving ahead on a one-third, one-third, one-third basis. And I still am. I believe it's the only way forward into the future is to go with fiber. And we may have to go at this slowly, just like the Nordegg build-out. And as grants come forward, we have to be open enough to be able to pivot. We might not be able to have fiber to the home in three years or five years or maybe even 10 years. Maybe it'll take 20 years. But if we don't apply for these grants, that's telling the federal government and the province that we don't care and that we don't need it and that we're fine the way we are. And we're not fine the way we are. I've heard from young folks that won't live in this area because the what we have is not good enough. I, I, and I also know that in order to take um, opportunity of these grants, we have to have the engineering done. We have to have the engineering done. There's no two ways about it. So I, I, um, I, I'm not looking at fiber to the home as a way for the county to make money, but as a service to grow our population and our businesses. Um, we, we have an opportunity here, and we just may have to, to go slower than what we originally had planned. That's where I'm at. Thank you. Councillor Lougheed. Um, sure, as I, I think we all know this is very passionate uh, subject for our council and we put a lot of energies into trying to find solutions for our community to, to improve broadband service over the last number of years and uh, we have a plan to move forward with that on a slow basis I think that's a valid plan moving forward uh, in the absence of any federal or provincial real uh, commitment to moving forward with assistance to municipalities so I think we need to be somewhat flexible in understanding the parameters of the, the support we're going to get from the federal government. They are indicating that uh, this recent uh, funding opportunity is there. I don't know if we've got all our homework done or can we get our homework done to meet their grant. We've got quite a bit of work already done in background for that. Um, I think anything we could do in the short term would be a very high level engineering 
work. And I, I think we have to define if we are going to do some engineering work that would be very high level just to meet the, um, meet the um, needs of an application for, for these grants moving forward. It can't, I mean, the engineering could go into extremely high detail and that's, that's, that's indicating a commitment that we just don't, we just can't, we just can't reach that commitment without sponsorship from the other two levels of government. So my comments are around the engineering work has to be, if it is done, Specifically for the for the um, for the uh, opportunity to access future federal grants, Mr. Emmons. Thank you, Reeve Laird. So, I just wouldn't mind rolling it back just a little bit. Um, Council's motion was on fiber backbone. That's the engineering. That's the administrative work that we've completed. Was based on that motion. Um, Council goes forward uh, with what's being termed as a shift or a pivot. Uh, we don't have the engineering behind that to, to assist council. Um, I just want to be very clear that this would be, as always, this is 100%, but this will be a 100% council decision without the support of administration as far as researching and assisting. Um, this would be a decision based on a vision. All right. And I guess while I recognize that we need some high level of engineering for countywide fiber to the premise to apply for grants, I recognize that all also comes with a budget. And I have no indication in the information presented what that budget would look like to get that high level engineering. So it's a missing piece as I look here. We after all are in charge of making sure that we make informed decisions and it is a critical piece that is missing at the moment. I have left uh, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer for last. Uh, oh, sorry, I was, I'm trying to leave you for last. Councillor uh, Councillor Hoven, um, one more comment, and then uh, we'll have, uh, and Councillor Swanson, then we'll have Deputy Reeve Vandermeer make his comments before we have a vote. The one, I've got two comments. It was said here that fiber is the least cost to this municipality. And that is inaccurate. Fiber is the most capital intensive cost there is. To do fiber to the home, fiber to the premise as the motion says, can I say what the closed plan said it was gonna cost? Like here's the thing, we have the number in a book and we're so proud of that number, we can't even say it publicly. There is no way this is the least cost um, we did the pilot project to get numbers. We did the pilot project out to Ferrier to get the cost of putting fiber in the ground. We did the pilot project to test the different technologies that we need to know before we do that engineering so we know exactly what the costs are going to be. The pilot project is not complete. Mm -hmm. In fact, when we approved the money for the pilot project, we, it actually ended up costing us double what the original plan was. We have a plan on the books for fiber to the premise. We know what that number is. What if that number doubles? For us to go forward with this is so foolhardy, I can't think of the words to describe it. Now, I know everyone wants to improve broadband, but we've got a brick wall in front of us called reality. And that's dependent on how much money we have. And we do not have the funds to do this. And people are gonna say, oh, we'll get federal money. We know the UBF is from the consultants we had in this very room. They said it's over, gonna be oversubscribed by, by a, 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 10 times. So for every dollar requested, there's only gonna be 10 cents available. So we are throwing away a good plan, a slow and steady plan, 
to go to Vegas and roll the dice and hope we get the grant money. It is, this is, like I'll say it again, to vote for this is completely foolhardy and it shows a complete lack of wisdom and, uh, and you made a comment about doing it for vision. Voting for this shows a lack of vision. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Hoven, uh, Councillor Swanson. Uh, yes, um, just going back to um, two years ago when we did look at the Farrier Plan, it was presented to us uh, through a, another organization to take over the CTI grant, and we were lured, sorry, by the seventy-five cent dollars on that particular project. And I agree. And the priority at that time was for backbone. It was not for fiber to the premise, but we've added to that particular project by doing, like Councillor Hoven has said, fiber to the premise, uh, wireless service, etc. And we have to remember that these grants and it, it, including the universal broadband grant, is that although they are recycled dollars from over a year ago, which MP Soroka had confirmed to us back in September that that's what they were, um, we're going to be constantly pivoting to whatever grant that the federal government puts out and understand that they're going to be baiting us with this particular grant money because I believe that these grants will are being lobbied by, of course, the big three telecoms because it's going to make benefit them. It's not first. And then the scraps will go to whoever else comes to, you know, puts our application forward. And I agree, yes, they'll be oversubscribed. It's uh, been said that. But I also want to caution us because... We have been multiple, there's been multiple times we have been warned by our own province through various ministers that we are going to see, we're going to have to make do with less money in the future. We've already seen through the assessment model review that we aren't going to be having taxes from any new oil and gas in the next three years, which is going to cost this county. And we are very fortunate that we are sitting on the reserves that we do, and we're going to need that. This is going to be the biggest, this broadband project is the biggest expense infrastructure project that we are going to be putting in. And I believe as a municipality, we are trying to justify spending on a service we've never provided. We're good at roads. We're not good at telecoms. We're not good at this. And that's why we've hired and that's why we've directed administration to hire our own professional for this. And I'm sorry, at this point in time, it seems like we don't trust that prof professional, and I'm very sad to say that I do. Because it, or that, I'm very sad to say that I'm disappointed too, that we can't trust our administration in this. It, it's, it's perceived that way right now through my fellow counselors. I'm not, not, they're out of the room right now. And we need to in, trust that our administration is giving us the proper background, the proper information, and I am disappointed that we cannot, we're, 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 we can't, as good leadership needs, we need to stay the course. We, and we have to get out to the public with our, what we've already known, and we haven't done that. We are jumping ahead, and I am not in, I don't want to be react, reacting every time there's something out. Fiber to the premise. Is, does a gas company put fiber to the premise? Does power go fiber to the premise? No, it is goes to the curb, and it's that residence, then it's up to the residents to decide whether they want it or not. I've heard opposite about fiber to the premise. I've heard comments that said, we don't want Big Brother. We don't want Big Brother sitting there. So there's other opinions out there than fiber to the premise. It should be up to our uh, rate payers if they want it. If we go by, they want it, they pay. Or if it's up to the AISP that would like to um, put it in, maybe it's through us that we do a granting process. There's lots of options going forward, but we need to 
We've talked about this through other workshops and stuff, and we need to start talking public, more publicly about what we, are, what we have been talking about. So there's no more future, um, <laughs> no more future. Um, this, 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 is, this is, to me, out of process. This is not proper, and I'm, uh, we need to go through administration and follow due process. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Swanson. Are there any other comments before we uh, have a wrap up so that we can have a vote? Because I would like to give uh, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer um, an opportunity to uh, provide clarity around some of the comments that's being made. So if there's no other comments or questions, We'll leave it to uh, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. I'm hoping that you can wrap this up in maybe 10 minutes, five minutes. Short order. We, Short it, order. It, it, is one of, it is one at a time. All right. But, but it is a decision around doing this engineering. And uh, the engineering is the high level engineering for grant writing. And that is, uh, that is quite possible. Now, further down, I'm saying that we could take a little of the more detailed engineering from the backbone structure and apply it here. So there's a way of, of transposing. But the engineering firms, the one I know that we've, we're working with is a big firm, and they could do this little bit, I'm, I'm confident. But more importantly, uh, back to the points about whether this is, uh, is uh, in any way reckless or not a good thing. Uh, Council Lang is right that in the long run, in the long run, fiber to the premise is the cheapest. It provides the broadest range of capability for residents and businesses. And, uh, you know, it avoids the long-term purchase of spectrum if you're trying to do something in a wireless uh, vein. But most importantly, uh, if you stick with a wireless uh, mode, you're subjecting all of our residents to permanently be in a disadvantaged, uncompetitive uh, place to live. And we're trying to attract people to live here. We need new people with new ideas, new businesses to function and flourish in Clearwater County, to restore and expand our, our tax base. And they can't function. They can't do the economic development that's, that's absolutely essential to our future. They will be unable to do that without a proper service. Other municipalities, and I give you Red Deer County as, as one, are firmly committed to taking fiber to the premise. We can't be here in the backwoods. We're not a backwoods community, Clearwater County. We need to be competitive on a world basis Fiber to the premise is the way, and it's also been mentioned that we can, we can uh, slow it down if we have to, but we need to press pressure a federal government. There's a lot of things I disagree with, with this federal government and any federal government for that matter, but this one has clearly understood the difficulties of economic development and sustainability in rural areas and remote areas of Canada. They're asking for municipalities such as ourselves to step up and share this burden, make sure that this gets done. We need to respond to that, and it's not a huge thing on either count to do the engineering to enable applications. That's not a big thing. And secondly, the engineering going to uh, Racinus has been done by Magna and other groups before. It's, it's generic. It's it's easily good enough to put in an application in short order. The work to Nordeg is not, has not been done to my knowledge, but these other areas have been done to some level. So, so the engineers are starting from, uh, from a good base and they can easily do it. So with that, I think we need to uh, authorize them to uh, continue to uh, work that high level of engineering across the uh, County, and if it involves uh, a little less on something else, we'll see when we get to that whether we reduce the activity elsewhere or not. But 
But that is essential, and uh, the motion, uh, I will make it, if you like, at this time. So I would just, okay. before you do, Councillor Hoven. Councillor Deputy Mayor said that fiber is the least cost in the long run. I challenge that statement. The closed session plan we have that shows us the actual costs, well, I can't say what it says, but I would like to see the numbers that Councillor Vandermeer or Deputy V. Vandermeer has that prove that fiber is the least cost. If he's going to make that claim here in open session, he had better have the numbers. I, I, I would reference uh, studies done early on by uh, uh, Taylor Warwick in particular when you add on all of the long-term the long-term costs clearly it's the most expensive in the short term as you as you install it in the ground or even hanging it on poles it has a has a has a high initial cost and a very low long-run maintenance cost so it is it is a long-term phenomenon but again it's uh, it's getting started it's not committing to uh, get it all done in a particular time frame, we can we can chew this one bite at a time. We don't have to. Uh, nobody's asking for a commitment to uh, build the whole thing in one go. The federal funds are projected to run out over five years plus, and uh, and yes, we can afford to do it. I have looked at the uh, at uh, budgets and reserves also, and we can afford to do it. But even that, we are not committing the budget at this time. We will discuss that when we get to the budget in uh, next week. And all I would be asking for in the budget is one quarter and certainly no more than a half. Even if we were to use MSI funding, we would be in the range of a quarter to a half of the project funding. And on that basis, these more heavily populated areas and subdivisions will be shown as economic. All right. Um Councillor Lang. So um, as far as the cost of fiber compared to spectrum, I have studies at home that I can bring for you, Councillor Hovind. But we have an expert or an ISP provider in the room. Does anyone have a problem if I ask Mr. Swanson as to his experience as to the cost of fiber compared to spectrum, say over a 10, 20 year period? Do any of my fellow councillors have a problem with that? I'm just, we're, are we good with that or are we? Maybe Mr. Swanson doesn't want to answer it. I should ask him as well. Well, over the long term, cost of, the thing, Spectrum is changing too, how the government is charging for licensed Spectrum as well too. So it is pretty hard to forecast what, what they haven't released what the new pricing is going to be on licensed spectrum for backhauls and stuff like that as well too. Um, initially the expenses are definitely going to be cheaper to put up a wireless backhaul. Over 20 years possibly then a fiber backhaul would justify the expenses of doing of, of doing those type of licensed links. Um, so I personally I hate to expense it out over that long a period of time, but that is very much in this type of program would be a very much a reasonable decision to do so. Okay, thank you. Um, now to try to bring us back so that we aren't uh, continuing to discuss all of these, it fear, I fear we have. Um, the first motion uh, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer and I will say we've spoken about high level engineering. We've talked about it for grant applications. I, I think that uh, there's opportunity if you were considering your motion to, uh, to look at friendly or specify friendly amendments or specify it. And this this needs to be the motion so that we can so we can print it out and look at it. Well, if we want, or vote on it. Yeah. yeah. So okay. So the motion I wish to uh, bring forward, number one, is that council approves 
that the engineering of a countywide fiber to the premise deployment in sufficient detail to enable grant writing be Yeah. We've got to um, let administration catch up here yeah. a little bit. This is always the challenge when uh, administration hasn't had opportunity to uh, put the agenda item together. So we just need to show a level of patience and understanding. For grant writing purposes, the engineers will know what they need. <clears throat> that, that's sufficient. That is your motion? That's my motion. Um, Councillor Swanson beat you to the... Councillor Swanson? Um, just to inform my fellow councillors, just based on principle alone of the MGA, I will not be supporting any of these motions. Okay, Councillor Lang. Well, I now have uh, two, one, uh, I want to ask uh, Councillor Vandermeer for a friendly amendment to his motion, and I also want to ask uh, Councillor Michelle Swanson what she's read in the MGA. Um, but first of all, I'm going to ask for the friendly amendment. Um, Councillor Vandermeer, this is making it sound like it's countywide fiber to all the premises, and that is pr probably not going to be possible. So I'm one wondering if you would amend your motion to read to you know, 60, 70 percent of the homes yeah. in Clearwater County. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. To um, to the um, um, and I would say to 80% of the, of, uh, the population or something in that order. You, you were saying maybe 60 to 70%. It may not have to be more than that, but I, I, I think all of our population um, is all in a fairly compact area here. So it, I, I'm, I'm okay with 70%, the, the more populated, okay. 70%. Um, subsequent. Go ahead, Councillor Lang. What about if it was worded to um, no greater than 70%? Because I agree with you, most of the population is in concentrated areas. Okay, is that how it's looking? It should be um, approved engineering, take the 80% away and put it down below, engineering of fiber to the premise for 80% of the populated area within Clearwater County. Okay. I see we have uh, Councillor Duncan and Councillor Hoven. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking we're making this too convoluted here. The, the engineering of fiber to the premises for grant writing purposes, when we apply for the grants, and I can give the example of the, of the January 15th deadline if we're applying for one of those, which will come farther down in our list of, of resolutions here, that's a $5 million cap. So, you know, these, and we're going to have to rely on staff here as well in determining capacity and, uh, you know, what we're going to be able to do because, again, these projects have to be completed by November of 2021. So we're not going to be able to do the entire county in that time. These, If we are applying for grants for January 15th, uh, it's going to be for a specific area of the county. So I don't, I'm not comfortable with naming areas or sizes. I, I think it's 
fine to just fiber to the premises engineering in for the grant ready purposes for that we apply for. It's that's okay. The grant itself will determine the area we're going to apply for, okay. and the and when we do that, you know, the as we apply for these grants, it's it's great to apply for the grants, and we should be applying for grants, but but we don't have the capacity to do the entire county by November of 2021. These are going to be specific projects up to a $5 million cap, and we're trying to be flexible and apply for these grants. So I'm just wanting to leave it as a fiber for grant writing purposes. All right, Councillor Hoven. In the plan that we did a few years ago, there was preliminary high-level engineering already done Perhaps we should just release those reports to the public and we'd have, we wouldn't even have to pass this motion. And I mean the engineering, the finances, everything. That would make more sense than doing a motion to repeat what we've already done. Okay, uh, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. Oh, sorry, I... Uh, Jim had something. I, we probably Counselor. think the same way. I, we don't know if that engineering is, we have to look at the grant application. The grant application will tell you the level of engineering you need. It would be great if that, what engineering we've done already would, would suffice, but we don't know that. So uh, again, by approving the engineering of countywide fiber to the premises for grant writing, I don't know, I, I, is, is it not a leap to say that it could be existing engineering or, or engineering that is we need to do yet. Uh, I'm not sure what everybody reads into that, but to me it's just, whatever we have that's available, plus whatever we need to do in terms, to get done in terms of grant writing. Okay, uh, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. Yeah, I agree with uh, Councillor Duncan's comments. We have a fair amount of high level engineering already in place. I would expect the engineers taking this on would look at that, add whatever is needed. And the reason I'm suggesting that it be countywide is that they would, again, even the engineers would chew this off in bites size increments. They would only work on the uh, engineering that needs to be done for the January 15th. That's the first thing they would do. But my point is we should do it countywide because 95% of the county is underserved. And we should, in the next round, in February or the one after that, whatever we can do, put in for the rest of the county uh, and it won't it, it won't be uh, the whole county at one shot, but to have it done for those purposes so that we could go on record saying we're underserved and we want to, as the money becomes available, continue to roll this out. So that's the reason for doing the whole thing. And, and again, because I would see, you know, the standards, you know, the hookup on a premise versus what you're doing on the backbone, those would be consistent. So all you're doing is drawing lines on a map and adding them up. All right. We have two motions radically differently worded. Which motion are you making, Councillor or Deputy Reeve Vandermeer? Um, I would, uh, in the way I've described it, I'm happy with the last one. You know, I don't think we're ever going to do much above the 80% though. So, uh, Councillor Lang, you, you suggested the percentage on there. I'm okay with that as well. All right. So is that your motion, uh, that council approves the engineering of countywide fiber to the premise for grant writing purposes? Uh, grant writing purposes commencing with the rapid intake, rapid uh, response applications due January 15th. That would be very specific. So the, the rest will take whatever time it takes. Um, Councillor Lang. My understanding, I may be wrong, but that we don't need engineering. 
for the rapid response intake. You just said earlier, you need okay. shovel-ready projects. What we're doing, we're approving the engineering in 12 business days. This is such a horrible motion. People should be embarrassed to be part of this room right now. All right, we're going to take a break for lunch. We will be back at 1230.
All right, it's 12.30 and we're resuming uh, our council um, as per uh, where we left off at uh, 11.50. Uh, we're going to be continuing on with item 5.2, Universal Broadband Fund. Uh, Councillor Hoven. I would just like to apologize to Council for my uh, frustration and outburst there before lunch. It was unacceptable for this chamber, so I wholeheartedly apologize. Well, thank you for that. I can appreciate um, your level of passion, and uh, we all recognize the importance of this particular project. So... I think we all understand. All right, um, where we last left off is uh, developing a motion. Um, the, uh, where we had it was uh, with Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. Thank you, uh, Reeve. Um, just looking at these two drafts, if you took the last part of the lower one, commencing with the rapid response applications due January 15th, 21, and put that on the bottom of the other one, I think we got it. <clears throat> All right. So, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer, if you would read your motion. My motion is that Council approves the engineering of fiber to the premises for 80% of the populated area within Clearwater County for grant writing purposes, commencing with the rapid response applications due January 15th, 2021. Okay. Um, Councillor Lang. Um. I'm going to make a comment and I'm going to ask administration a question. My comment is, and we kind of talked about this right before lunch. My comment was I do not believe we need engineering for the rapid response starting January 15th. And the reason I made that comment is because I had a conversation with the owner of Lightlink. And you don't need engineering. <clears throat> so that's my comment. And that's why I said that before lunch. Um, but my question is, and I have concerns, January 15th is not too far down the road. Does staff have time to get an application in in time? I want administration to be very honest. Mr. Emmons. Thank you, Reeve Laird, and for the question, Councillor Lang. Administration will do our very best. Um, you're right, it's very short. Uh, I can't make promises, uh, I won't. Um, but we will endeavor uh, to do our very best. We always do with any council motion. <clears throat> okay, any other questions or comments? All right. Perhaps we should remove that bottom motion just so that it's not in the way. Everybody understands the question? Those in favor? That is four. Those opposed? That is three. It is carried. All right. Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. I understand you have additional. Yes. The, the next motion and. For clarity, it might be best if we broke this into two. We heard this morning that there was an application being put forward for the farrier area. Uh, I don't know if we should, uh, or should, certainly we should put that at the bottom of the list. So the, the first one I would uh, make motion on is the preparation of an application uh, to the January 15th in UBF intake deadline for the Rocky to Nordeg 
um, including fiber to the premise in Nordegg. Okay, how did you want it revised? Um, I, I think it's it's easier. The, the one, the Ferrier and Crimson Lake one, could have more discussion on it. So I would uh, propose that uh, we just take one bite at a time and have a motion to go all the way down to Nordegg slash Bighorn, put a period there, and say that's the motion. Then we'd have another motion to follow. That would be uh, Rocky Mountain House to Racinus with the same verbiage ahead of it. Then lastly, take a look at, at Ferry because that may have more discussion. <clears throat> All right, are there any other questions? Councillor Duncan. Um, just to clarify the, the resolution. So I would say just the submission of a of grant application as opposed to three applications because yes. you're just naming one of them in each of the of the motions. And before for a fiber construction project that includes, sorry, just, yeah, right that line there, a fiber construction project, because it's just one, not projects. And that includes, yes. for the following project. <clears throat> for, it didn't be the following projects, for the Rocky Mountain House to Nordegg Bighorn project. Maybe. Yeah. Be simpler. That'd be fine. And then each resolution thereafter can just substitute the words. Okay. Project. Other comments or questions? Councillor Duncan? I, I think there might be, well, I, my two concerns would be capacity and if there are other things coming forward. So uh, the information that we may pertain to, and again, I, we're strained here beyond what's in camera and what is not, but uh, okay. I think in terms of capacity and, and what we've also already proposed to do you know, going at least as far as Racinus or on to Olds, that for me, the only one that makes sense for the January 15th deadline would be the Rocky to Racinus one. Um, so that's my comment there. Um, I would not probably support this one to Rocky Mountain to Nordic at this time. I don't think we have the capacity. And I think there's other information that may come forward that would help us decide a different direction on that project. All right, thank you. Councillor Lougheed. Yeah, I agree with Councillor Duncan. This this one, we're, um, I think we're, we've already stretched the capacity of our organization with what we're uh, looking at doing here. I think um, any, any success that would be um, brought by receiving a grant on this would be under, overshadowed by not having enough time to properly prepare for all the ramifications and how we move this forward in, in business plans uh, with, with this kind of extra endeavor. Okay then, uh, then my comment, given, given those remarks, let's flip this one and make it uh, to Farrier uh, 
call it the Rocky Mountain House to Ferrier project, given those comments, and there's a preference here, and I knew there would be some preference on the on, on these. Councillor Hoven. Rocky Mountain House to uh, Racinus. Sorry. If, if there is a motion, I think we should vote on it instead of just getting a consensus it's not going to pass and then changing the motion so it passes. We have a motion for Rocky to Nordegg, and I think it should be voted on I, before I we change it and make it a totally different motion. We had a draft. I had not made it as a formal motion, so it was up for discussion. This is very much like we work in our workshops, so it's we're way outside of uh, normal council uh, protocols. Um, if we can try to focus <clears throat> our energies on what we want to have in front of us to vote on, we need to do that with more precision. So I will ask that we try to stick to the motions as they're presented and uh, perhaps not continue to change them as we go. So we, this last one we have changed. We've asked, we've been asked by one of our councillors not to keep changing them. What is the wishes of this council? Councillor Lang. I guess we have to decide, was that a change or was that an amendment to the motion? And we're allowed to do amendments to the motion. So maybe, Councillor Duncan, you didn't word it as an amendment to the motion, but I'm, I'm thinking that's maybe what it was. Councillor Duncan. I, I wasn't really seeking to amend the motion. I was just looking at them in the, for myself in the order that it makes the most sense to, to approve or not approve. Uh, I am happy with if we want to stay with the original I, I know how I would vote on each of them separately. I'm just, I was looking for the, the wording. To me, they're all worded exactly the same, except for the, the different directions because of different <laughs> projects. So um, it, it doesn't matter to me. I, okay. So Councillor Duncan, I, I believe your intent is simply that we would work through the process for each of these three right. and vote on them separately regardless which should meet the intent of Councillor Hoven's uh, recommendation as well. All right, so we're gonna start with the Rocky Mountain House to Racinus project. Um, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer, perhaps you can read this motion. Yes, uh, I, I move that Council approves the preparation and submission of a grant application to the January 15, 2021 Universal Broadband Fund intake deadline fiber for a fiber construction project a fiber construction project a fiber construction project uh, that includes backbone extension and fiber to the premises as can be accommodated within the five million dollar maximum project size for rocky mountain house to racinus project <clears throat> All right, um, Councillor Duncan, you wanted so to make sorry. a comment? No. All right, I will. Oh, Councillor Hoven. Question for administration: Do we have the uh, skills in house to do the uh, required engineering for this project, or will we have to hire outside consultants to do the engineering? The latter. Councillor Hoven, we would have to hire out. Okay, is it possible we can hire outside engineers with 12 business days before the grant deadline over the Christmas season? Or is, in your opinion, is that almost physically impossible? We've already given our consultants, our engineers, the heads up that this would be a priority for them. So I can't promise, but they will be asked okay. if they can meet those deadlines. Thank you. All right. Councillor Lang. Just a, just a thought here. Um, I've, I've heard that this January 15th is already oversubscribed. 
And I, uh, I think our chances of getting a grant is low because of that. But um, there can be learnings from sending in an application. We may find out where our shortfalls are, which would prepare us better for in the future. It, as far as putting in applications and make sure we'd have all our I's and T's crossed. Great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on that motion? Seeing none, those in favor? That is three. Those opposed? That is four. It is defeated. Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. <clears throat> well, I'm not uh, given given that one that was uh, fairly easy. I'm uh, I'm not going to propose the other ones at this time. Okay. Um, I guess the question is, can we, It look, well, it looks to me like there's appetite for continuing with the uh, backbone fiber at this point. There appears to be with the current motion that has stood since we created it <clears throat> a number of months ago. Would you like a few minutes recess to give this some consideration? Uh, no. Um, okay. I think... Uh, I think we should move ahead uh, with the meeting. And if there's any notices of motion, um, maybe I'd come back for that at the end of the meeting. That, uh, that is appropriate. It is under <clears throat> item no number 12, where we would have notices of a motion. Of motion. Okay. All right. Are you uh, then indicating that uh, we should move on uh, to item 6.1? Yes. Okay. Uh, item 6.1, Wild Rose School Division. Okay. Oh, okay. Mr. Hanson. If, uh, if Mr. Emmons, okay. Okay. Did you want to start off? You want me? Okay. Mr. Emmons. Thank you, Reeve Laird. So this item before council today for a decision uh, is correspondence between Wild Rose and Clearwater County. Staff recommendation that council includes capital estimated at $40,000 and annual operating cost estimated at $3,000 for gas and electrical utilities at the Condor and Lesseville skating rinks in the 2021 budget of dele delegations coming up. I will hand the floor over to Mr. Matt Martins at this time, our Director of Ag and Community, and accompanying him is Anna Marie Bertinoli. Right. Sorry I'm late, Council. You're um, just fine. As the CAO pointed out, we've been asked by the school division to help or consider helping with the 
direct costs associated with the arenas. Um, certainly, these are important pieces of infrastructure to the communities, and I think um, the uh, um, the need is is important to the community as uh, most of the use of the the skating rinks happen. Um, at night during the winter time. And so lighting is very important. A little bit of use during the, the weekend. Um, we've provided the uh, um, information that Wild Rose has submitted to us regarding the capital costs and the uh, long-term operating costs. I'll turn it back over to the Reeve if there's any questions for administration. All right. You've got... Um, <clears throat> Uh, agenda item before you with regard to uh, the skating rinks as presented. Any uh, comments or questions? I see that uh, Councillor Lougheed and then Councillor Duncan. Yes, certainly. Uh, this has been brought forward to me too from the Recreation Board. And, and these, these rinks are both used extensively by the community and have been um, in the past supported by the community in their construction, operation and maintenance. Um, it, it reaches a point with the new schools going in place that um, um, the opportunities that were there in the past to work work on a cooperative basis with Wild Rose School Division on utilities don't seem to be there now. And it will be a, a hardship to the communities to come up with the uh, funds necessary to tie into the new schools. So I think uh, a bit of a discussion around if, if there's something that this, that this um, county can do to support recreation to this level within the communities. Councillor Duncan. Um, I s basically, it be we become the owners of these rinks then. Uh, and I see that there's a recommendation to also look at a joint use agreement, which is a good idea. Uh, I, maybe Councillor Law, he might be able to provide some clarification. And especially during COVID times, is there, I'm. What about enforcing rules? Is that going to, or you know, even uh, opening and closing times? How has that been dealt with in the past for the rinks? It's, I and I'm not suggesting that anything untoward's happening, but just there must be something there that regulates the use of these that we may have to assume some of that responsibility here as well. All right, uh, Councillor Lougheed. Sure, I can maybe just shed a little bit of light for council. Um, I think both the rink at Lesseville and the rink at uh, Condor are both going to be closed through the construction process. So that's how they're being dealt with at the moment. Those rinks will not be flooded if, if current conditions stay the way. I think irregardless of COVID restrictions, I don't think those rinks will be operated. I know at Condor, there is um, an impromptu rink that's being flooded at the moment for community use. Um, I'm not sure what the status of that is. I haven't been involved with that, but I, I definitely see the work going into that. So that's one of the initiatives that community has, has taken. Um, and I think, yeah, in the past, um, it's pretty much an honor system for the usage at the rink. There was, you know, community involvement, whether it was fire department or community center or school on a cooperative joint use type basis, uh, worked with, um, you know, trying to upgrade the facilities as a joint project, and uh, each 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 group took a, a certain level of responsibility for for those uh, funding those things and and what part they could do in in kind of a. I mean, if there wasn't an official joint use on that, there was a, an a, a, a understanding of how they were ran in the past. All right, um, Councillor Lang. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, I actually have a question. I'm wondering, um, has one of the community associations in either Lesseville or Condor or both being considered or approached to help um, with managing how this is going to work? Um, it just seems like it would be a, a good fit. <clears throat> Mr. Martinson. So, um, yes, uh, the rec board for the two communities have been quite involved and we've been in discussions with them 
about this and, and, and other school build issues. Um, and we'll continue to do that. We, we believe that's the best community group to work with. We're not aware of really any formal uh, community associations or anything um, that we're aware of that, that we would work directly with. But of course, um, the rec board itself has a significant um, representation from all parts. And so we, we lean heavily on, on, on their uh, input uh, when it comes to consulting with the community. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Yes, um, we have worked with the, the community groups and we definitely uh, intend on doing that. Um, we, we are recommending that the um, long-term operational costs be uh, included in the um, rec board's future allocations should council choose to provide the operating funding. We also are recommending that the rec board um, be tasked with negotiating the joint use agreement. Of course, council has to approve all agreements, but um, it's not uncommon to utilize uh, other mechanisms to negotiate and uh, the rec board uh, would be that uh, mechanism in our opinion. So we believe that, uh, that uh, there is future need for them to be involved in this. Um, it's just beyond their capacity at this moment to come up with the, the uh, total capital costs in this short period of time. All right, and I appreciate that. I, I also recognize that, you know, at least from my perspective, I always think it's important to have um, things be fair, obviously. And, you know, we're going to have eyes on us about this one and recognizing there are other community associations that ask for funding, etc. cetera. So uh, I think we need to identify why this is different. Um, and try to find our way forward on uh, ensuring that we're as fair as we possibly can be between one area and another. Um, and I know we recently put some dollars towards Nordeg in particular, and uh, uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Councillor Lang, but I, I recognize that this is a different number than we did uh, provide to the Nordeg group. Uh, Councillor Lang. I was just going to say that uh, the, as far as I know, the utilities for the lighting, both at Nordic and Ferrier, is paid for out of their own community, out of their own grant money that they received. Okay. All right. So we do have a staff recommendation in front of us uh, that council includes capital estimated at forty thousand dollars and an annual operating cost estimated at three thousand dollars for the gas and electrical utilities at the condor and lesseville skating rinks in the 2021 budget would someone like to make that motion oh sorry mr hagan just Thank you, Reva. I just wanted to clarify for Council that while the $40,000 may be considered capital from the perspective of the Wild Rose School Division, it'll actually be an operating expense to Clearwater County since we don't own that property. Okay. So Council could expect to see $43,000 in the operating budget for 2021. And I would just suggest that the motion include the word draft before budget because it has not been approved yet. Does everybody understand that uh, that change or amendment? Uh, Councillor Hoven. A question for administration. Currently with the, or not currently, in the past with the two skating rinks, if there was an injury on that ice after hours, who was liable? Was that the school board? Because it would not be the county because we were not involved with that. If we build this facility on Wild Rose property, and then someone gets checked in the boards at midnight and breaks their neck. Are we liable? Mr. Emmons. I would suggest that under any form of partnership, it exposes you to a certain level of liability. Um, so short answer, yes. Um, the successfulness of that suit, uh, I think could be challenged but any partnership would, yes, open up the opportunity. 
You're welcome. Councillor Lang. I'm sorry. <laughs> to keeping you on your toes. It's all good. All right, so uh, with that amendment to say draft budget, um, looking for somebody to make that motion. Um, Councillor Duncan, those in favor? That is seven to zero and it is carried, thank you. Six point two municipal organizational support transfer MOST funding for Clearwater County Community Halls and Community or Rocky Mountain House Pioneer Center. Mr. Martinson. Thank you, Reeve Laird. Um, our second item here is uh, to discuss emergency funding for community halls. Um, we have um, received a grant that would be um, potentially available to support community halls. Um, we've communicated quite uh, regularly with the community halls and community associations that we work with throughout the pandemic. And we have um, gathered information that suggests that um, on average, uh, halls are reporting a, a, a loss um, um, of about 80% over uh, their uh, similar comparables from other years. Uh, this is concerning to us. Um, it's been concerning to us for, um, you know, the, the majority of the summer. Um, for small halls, that 80% looks like uh, approximately $21,000 on average for, uh, sorry, for large halls. For small halls, you know, that number is 8,000. Um, regardless of the number, you know, it's significant uh, for sure. Um, we've also been in discussion with um, the Pioneer Center and, and they are another uh, community group that we work closely with and, and council has supported their activities for quite some time uh, in the budget. They have um, suggested to us that they um, are uh, in the midst of some significant financial strain as well. And they had requested uh, additional funding from the uh, county uh, during our regular granting process. So we've included them in this um, because they are the only other group that we've talked to that are, uh, uh, in our opinion, that have, that have communicated to us that they're receiving a significant strain from uh, COVID. Um, Counts, the county's most allocation for Clearwater County was 1.2 million um, and change. So um, we are asking to utilize 137,000 of that to, to support these uh, community groups for emergency one-time funding only. Um, we've had a thorough discussion about this with the entire county administration and administration is comfortable that this still allows us plenty of um, resources to continue on with uh, dealing with the pandemic, because of course uh, um, there's still lots of pandemic left and we still need uh, resources uh, to deal with it. So um, the administration's comfortable that if we allocate this, uh, should council approve it right away, that we um, would still have plenty of, of, of uh, buffer uh, within that um, uh, grant or uh, um, transfer to uh, continue on through the pandemic. I'll turn it back over to the Reeve if there's any questions. All right, um, Councillor Lang. Um, Matt, I'm just curious as to the history of how the county got involved in supporting the Pioneer Center since it is a hall within the town. I, I was not aware that we supported them. And I am curious if the town um, contributes to their uh, sustainability. I don't know the answer to either of those questions. Sorry, Councillor Lang. It predates my uh, involvement in community services, so it goes back well, you know, before 2018. Um, it's been in the budget um, since then as far as this council support. Um, I'm not uh, 
I'm not uh, aware of whether the town uh, provides support or not. All right, thank you for that. But I believe Councillor Duncan may have uh, some history for us. I do a bit, and I don't know if the, my numbers will be entirely accurate, but back in the, the town supports them right now with snow clearing, uh, no taxes, uh, and I not and I think that's about it for support from the town and some I think they've contributed to some capital funding in the past as well and I think it was recognized back in the day that there are county residents that go there as well as or even ex-county residents if they have moved to town in their retirement years that go, use the facilities there as well and that's probably some of the reason it tradition has been a that 5,000 has been in budget for as long as we've been on council or I've been on council probably for John as well so all right. Other questions or comments? The first uh, staff recommendation is that uh, council approves providing each of the 18 community halls um, $7,500. The source of this funding will be a portion of the MOST grant. I'm, uh, I can say that I'm very pleased to see that our staff has uh, had those conversations. There is no doubt our community halls are struggling, as are many people in our community. And it is uh, good to see that we're looking out and trying to provide for the stop gap so that those community halls and all the good work they do continue to keep the lights on and keep providing that. So I'm glad that staff is making this recommendation. Uh, looking for somebody to make that motion. I did have one more question. We also provide a $2,000 a year grant to the Pioneer Center for travel. Um, I'm just wondering about, and potentially did they use that this summer or not? I'm not sure what that, uh, I don't know if you have any comments there. It's pretty early in the year, they haven't filed a year and reported or anything. Um, so um, if we if we uh, look back to how we support these groups through budget, we do support the Pioneer Center transportation groups separately to the Pioneer Center operating for the facility itself. So um, they have provided us, it's kind of different groups that manage them within there and then their functions are different. So we've treated them differently um, as far as how we manage their, their grants and their allocations. Uh, or steward their asks to council for a better uh, explanation. Um, so the group that submitted the grant for the facility or the Pioneer Operating, they had shared to us that, that they are in need. The transportation group submitted a application that suggested that they are not. So their ask for next year has been reduced because they never utilized the amount that we allocated last year. We wouldn't recommend that they allocate between the two because we have asked them to report back separately and utilize the money separately. Um, so we have communicated to them that that would be uh, appropriate um, to carry forward some of their transportation funding from last year in hopes that maybe next year they can be doing some uh, work rather than refunding us and then having us send it back to them next year. That's typically the, the route we would take. So um, to kind of summarize and answer the question, yes, the transportation group has requested less for 2021 because they never utilized as much as 2020. The operation group has asked for more because their expenses were higher and their revenues were less to try to keep uh, their service going. Thank you for that. That'll, I think, suffice for till budget to say. So. All right, Councillor Lang. Um, Matt, I'm curious, this most grant, is this something that municipalities automatically get or do we have to apply for and does it does the town did the town get this grant as well mr. Martinson I might defer to uh, my esteemed colleague mr. Hagen director of corporate services please that was a very nice uh, toss over to mr. Hagen <laughs> I'll try not to fumble it <laughs> thank you Reeve um, to answer your question Councillor Lang um, this was a provincial government initiative to establish these grants um, based on per capita basis. So towns, villages, and counties all received grant amounts. 
uh, Clearwater counties, as Mr. Martinson mentioned, is in the neighborhood of 1.2 million and will cover our COVID costs to date, uh, plus anticipated costs as well. Okay. So we have the motion uh, on the floor by uh, Councillor Duncan. Seeing no other questions or comments, those in favor? That is carried seven to zero. The second motion is that council approves uh, providing the Pioneer Center $2,000. The source of this funding will be a portion of the MOST grant. Councillor Swanson is making that motion. Any other questions or comments? Councillor Lang? My comment is, um, first of all, this is a hall within the town. And I, I think, you know, I don't know if the Pioneer Center has ever gone to the town and asked for support. Um, given that the town now has this most funding, I think it would be an appropriate time that the Pioneer Center went to the town and asked for an additional $2,000. Any other comments or questions? Councillor Duncan? It's hard to know right now what, because we don't know if they've actually, they may have asked the town for something and I we don't know all their uh, expenses and who pays or what the town's contributed to say. It was a guess on my part. I'm, I'm almost certain that the snow plowing and in lieu of taxes goes there. I, I don't even know who has title to that building. I'm not sure. So uh, it may be the town. I, I don't know. Uh, so there's, it's, it would be hard for us to, to, to make that call or at this point we could, if you would care to table it, we do have till budget time, although January 15th is the, it's kind of a cart before the horse thing here, right? If, if it's, if it comes, the money's not, doesn't have to go today, it would go in the next budget cycle, which is next year, but we are not meeting again as a council until after we've approved our budget. So uh, we could, uh, you could ask, I suppose, an, uh, perhaps it's an option for us to table this and, and just refer it to budget discussions and ask for more information on, on what contributions are made to the Pioneer Center by municipal governments. Because um, we don't receive a, I'm not sure unless staff has that, we don't receive their financials yearly from for this, or do we? Um, you yes, may sir. not be aware of what's in them, but. Uh, yeah, we, we receive financials from all groups that we provide uh, grant funding to or that council provides a, a, a grant uh, line a line item in. So we do have have some information for them. It, it, financials may not address things like ownership of structures. And again, we're dealing with two groups that are operating uh, within the pioneer uh, realm. The uh, operations group, which covers the uh, com uh, the, the facility um, 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 itself, and then there's the transportation group, which provides service to provide uh, transportation to, say, a Rosebud Theater event or things like that. It 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 may not be as a it, it may not be quite appropriate to call them a community hall in the sense that they're not as much like Dover Court or Loose Oppet, but they're more of a community club with their uh, kind of focus to serve seniors, uh, is, hence the Pioneer Center, um, you, you know, services and, 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 and uh, uh, community uh, events uh, focused towards, you know, those people that built this community, the Pioneers. So that's that's kind of how they're uh, uh, situated and, 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 and the, the role they play in the community. Great, uh, Councillor Lang, and then I'm going to Council. Oh, sorry, uh, Councillor. Uh, I, I would only you add another just as sorry. I would only add just as a personal note on this one that uh, Rocky Whirlaways that I'm a member of, this social or square and round dancing, is probably the one of the the largest renters of the hall, uh, and we have not. And I would say that well over half of the members of that club are county residents, and they have not. We have not have any functions at all much since back in March. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just for constant information. Well, 
I appreciate that. I'll go to Councillor Lang and then Councillor Swanson. I also used to belong to the railways. So. Um, I, I'm going to make a motion that um, we table um, providing the Pioneer Centre $2,000 until administration is able to bring us back more information um, as to where they've get their funding and if they've got received any from the town and if they've requested the town for, for funding. Just on uh, protocol. Uh. Thank you, Reeve. Laird, <clears throat> there is a motion on the floor yes. by Councillor Swanson. Yes. So that will need to be taken care of first. Thank you, Councillor Swanson. Um, I guess for me, I'm looking at this from a big picture, and uh, I want our Pioneer Centre to be operational when post-COVID comes, because I believe that'll be a critical social hub for our seniors once the COVID subsides. So um, $2,000 really in the grand scheme of things, um, regardless. The town of Rocky Mountain House chooses to support that their, that building on their own merit, whether they be through like like Jim has referred to in regards to snow clearing, no taxes, etc. Um, this is more to the fact that we want to continue the, the to have those doors open post COVID. I, that's the way I'm I'm reading this. So I am happy to again just support the motion as stated. Staff recommendation. Okay, Councillor Lang. Um. I agree with Councillor Swanson. I want the doors to continue to remain open after post-COVID too. I just want um, our council to make proper decisions once we get all the information. All right, the first motion is uh, that council approves providing the Pioneer Center $2,000, the source of the funding will be a portion of the MOST grant and that motion is being put uh, forth by Councillor Swanson. Those in favor? That is six. Those opposed? One. It's carried. All right, I wasn't sure if we needed a moment to do some COVID cleaning there. We're now up to, uh, I actually wanna take a moment to back up to 5.2 uh, on the Universal Broadband Fund. I believe we would need a notice uh, or a motion to table that uh, item at this point. I'll make the motion to table. Deputy Reeve Vandermeer is making a Motion to table that. Those in favor? That is five. Those opposed? To two. All right. Item number 7.1. Laird, members of council. Um, before council is a uh, election bylaw 1102-20. slash uh, this item was before council just about a month ago um, and it, within the new uh, elections bylaw draft allows for that creation of a permanent electors register as well as for uh, special ballots and other considerations related to the election. Uh, as council has seen this before, I won't go into uh, much further detail other than that attached for council's consideration is second and third reading of uh, the, the aforementioned bylaw. Um, I did, I did want to note um, one thing though from previous motions. Should council wish to approve uh, second and third reading of elections bylaw 1102, uh, um, special ballots would take that place of the uh, electors assistance at home, which was discussed in resolution 357 2020 uh, earlier in the year. So special ballots would take the place of electors at home visits uh, should this uh, bylaw be enacted. Thank you. All right. Any uh, questions? 
right? Looking for a motion for second reading. Councillor Swanson, any questions? Seeing none, those in favor? That is seven to zero, it is carried. Third reading, Deputy Reed Vandermeer, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, those in favor? That is seven to zero and it is carried. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Public Works 8.1 Spate Road, Spate Road Base Pave Tender Award. Mr. Hansen. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Rivliard and uh, Council members. Uh, this item is a, uh, it's a prelude to our upcoming 2021 budget deliberations as well as uh, a good kickoff to our 2021 uh, capital plans for the upcoming construction season. Clearwater County recently tendered the granular base course, asphalt concrete pavement and other work for the Spate Road from Range Road 8-3A to Highway 752. This is approximately 6.7 kilometers. A closed tender opening was held for the work outlined above on November 26. Uh, seven bids were submitted ranging from approximately $3 million as high as $3.6 million. Uh, the low bidder that met the contractual obligations at the, bid, at the bid stage was Central City Asphalt Limited. The total project cost is estimated to be approximately $13,700 under the engineer's estimated amount of $3.6 million. So, we did see uh, reasonably good pricing in comparison. Uh, the estimate was based on the 2020 unit price averages and historical costs. Those, uh, those comparisons are outlined in the agenda. Um, it's one other uh, piece to note is that the other project costs that's been asterisked at the bottom of that line item was uh, other project costs associated with the railroad, railroad crossing lights that um, Tidewater has agreed to cost share with Clearwater County. Uh, it was going to happen this year, but they, uh, um, they were kind of quiet for a while, and the contractors now provided the input to us. They said that would be done prior to the paving there next year. Um, so the combined cost for this project, including the grading, uh, 2020, and the paving is approximately uh, just over $6 million, or $886,000 a kilometer. Uh, comparatively, the total grading base pave cost for the time you rode, that 6.4 kilometers, was approximately $822,000 per kilometer. Uh, the cost will be reflected in the upcoming, uh, I guess, draft 2021 budget. I guess that would be the amendment to the, uh, to the uh, recommendation, if we could put one in, and presented with the associated funding strategy, which I do believe it'll be coming out of uh, paving reserve. So the staff recommendation. The council reviews the information provided and approved awarding the Spate Road granular base course, asphalt concrete pavement and other work project to Central City Asphalt Limited for the budgeted year of 2021. All right, thank you. Who would like to make that motion? I bet it was gonna be Councillor Duncan. <laughs> having driven, having Having had the opportunity to drive it in the dust into the sun one evening, I can appreciate why you're making that motion. All right, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, those in favor? That is seven to zero, it is carried. That brings us to 9.1. Staffing policy, HR 1003, and procedure proposed amendments. Thank you, Reeve Laird. So the staff recommendation uh, on the staffing policy, HR 1003, and procedural proposed amendments before council today that council lifts the staffing policy HR 1003 and procedure proposed amendments from the table. Once that is done, should council do that, that council reviews and discusses the proposed amendment to staffing policy HR 1003. 
Do we have uh, a council member who's prepared to lift that from the table? Councillor Lang? All right, those in favor? Seven to zero, that is carried. Thank you, Reeve Laird. So as council may recall, in retreat on November 13th, this policy was discussed and council consensus at that time was to bring forward an amendment that reflected uh, council's philosophy on succession planning. That amendment was added into this policy uh, for council's review, which reflects in I'm looking for the change in the attached policy that states succession planning is not a guarantee. And where would we find it again? It's on the last page of the policy attached. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Councillor Hoven. Practically speaking, uh, Mr. Ammons, what change is this going to have on how administration operates? Uh, it won't Councillor Hoven, um, but it does clarify for administration council's intent and that administration council are on the same page in the way we administer your policy. Um, we've never stated that succession is a guarantee. It's a plan. And um, I personally do think that it helps perhaps even mitigate some expectation. Um, so it, it just more clearly communicates. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Looking for someone to make that motion. Councillor Lang, that uh, we would uh, review and uh, approve the revised staffing policy as presented. All right. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, those in favor? That is seven to zero, it is carried. Uh, professional development, counselor leadership training. Thank you, Reeve Laird. So this is agenda before council today, the staff recommendation that council approves councilors participation in the Unstoppable Conversations Leadership Program and directs administration to schedule and book a one day workshop as per participants availability. So the background for council on this one, uh, council did indicate interest in improving required skill sets to meet current and upcoming leadership and government challenges resulting from intermunicipal negotiations and regional governance restructuring study processes. As per governing principles in council's bylaw 1034, code of conduct, the public expects the highest standards of personal and professional conduct from members elected to Clearwater County Council or appointed to council committees. Clearwater County re requires that councillors and committee members conduct themselves so as to maintain the honor and respect of their position and not to engage in actions which are or could be reasonably perceived as damaging to the trust, confidence and faith of the public. Councillors and committee members must always seek to advance the good of Clearwater County as a whole for which they serve and shall truly, faithfully and impartially exercise the duties and responsibilities of their position to the best of their knowledge and ability. A comprehensive skill set and depth of expertise learned through professional development and governance training supports successful implementation of the above principles to ensure public expectations are met. Administration was asked to make inquiries on the cost and availability of a facilitator from Unstoppable Conversations, a firm that offers leadership training programs and resources designed to increase leadership performance and to conduct, conduct this one-day workshop. 
A facilitator is available as of January 2021 at a cost of $8,000 for the full day or eight one-hour group or individual follow-up up coaching sessions at a cost of $6,000. The workshop combined with the follow-up sessions is designed to give council the ability to positively impact relationships and get work done effectively. Unstoppable conversations suggest intended outcome and results of this intensive workshop and sessions are as follows. Number one, the creation of a team of people who can be responsible for the promises they make and hold the future of their community as their own future. Number two, a unified team that is unafraid to say what needs to be said and can hear without defensiveness what needs to be said. And number three, a team that drives transformational communication using an innovative approach combined with rational governance to achieve breakthrough developments to meet the objectives. Thank you, Reeve Lard. All right, so the staff recommendation uh, would be that we approve the councillor's participation in the Unstoppable Conversations Leadership Program and direct administration to schedule and book a one-day workshop as per participants' availability. I would like to make that motion, if I can. What? Uh, from the agenda, the only thing I hear missing is whether or not council wants to participate in the follow-up sessions as well. Okay. Would we like to participate in follow-up sessions as well? Councillor Hoven. If we're gonna do this, I would be interested in the follow-up sessions. But if I could go back one step, if this is because of COVID, if this is gonna be an online thing where we're watching a computer screen, I'm totally not in favor of that. I, we've had too many things staring at a computer screen and I don't think we would get our value so for me, that is a, a make or break it. So was there any discussion with Unstoppable about this? Um, <clears throat> yes, Unstoppable Conversations prefers to have a virtual session at this time due to COVID. Thank you. Okay, other comments, uh, Councillor Duncan? I would agree with Councillor Hoven. Uh, I think this, this type of workshop needs to be in person. Uh, my other question here is, is for a virtual workshop, $8,000? I, I have to question that cost for a one day workshop. I, if this is a service they're providing on more than one occasion, I, I don't understand it how much preparation there would be or because $8,000 seems to end $6,000 for, for a follow-up. Uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with that, but let's deal with a virtual workshop versus in-person first. It sounds like it is virtual workshop. <clears throat> Thank you, Ray Blaird. Um, <clears throat> unstoppable, unstoppable conversations. The, the pricing is for an in-person. Um, but they did say that they preferred a virtual and that they that the pricing would change if it was virtual. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Councillor Duncan. Um, we have had exposure to unstoppable conversations previously. Um, from that experience, I would say that that their process is, is not a short one. Like I, I think it's more than a one day fix, which uh, you know, I can see why follow up sessions would be appropriate as well. Um, I don't know, I'm still struggling a bit, I guess. I, I'm not sure we would, I, I think we might get through the one or two days and decide that we may need some more that we're not finished depending on it will be different because it is just ourselves in the room as opposed to a number of municipalities but uh, considering the the day we put in at council retreat and you know how much we accomplished there we did accomplish things but this I say the their their style to me is a is a 
process that requires practice as well as um, I don't think this will be the end of what we need to, to accomplish our goals. It's my feelings on that. All right. Other comments? Okay. Um, Deputy Reef Vantmeer. Yeah, I, I agree with the comments we've heard from uh, Councillors Hoven and uh, Duncan, that uh, that doing this virtually, I, I just don't think it's going to uh, meet the meet the necessities. So, uh, and given the COVID situation, I think we might have to defer it. And if we start deferring it towards the end of our term, I'm thinking it might be best for the next council. Just just looking at the duration here of this problem that we're facing at this time. I understand. Any other comments? All right. Well, if this is to be done uh, virtually, by the sounds of it, it is. I am prepared to put the motion forward as is. And we will, we'd endeavor, we'd prefer to have it not virtual but we understand COVID impacts this. So I will make the motion. Any other questions or comments? Those in favor? Okay, that is three. Those opposed? Four, that is defeated. All right. Question. Councillor Hoven. Would they be open to a in-house session if the COVID situation turns around and the numbers start going down? Was that a possibility or they're just not interested? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you to staff for making those efforts to find that information on our behalf. 10.1, CAO report. Thank you, Reeve Laird and Council. So the December 8th CAO report, the first item, in order to renew our core, our certificate of recognition certificate, a municipality must pass an external audit of their health and safety management system every three years. So that includes two internals and one external. To pass, this audit requires a minimum mark of 80% overall in the 10 elements that are inside the auditing tool. This audit must be completed using the Alberta Municipal Health and Safety Association audit tool. The certified auditor submits the completed audit to AMSA for a quality assurance review. If the audit meets the quality assurance standard, the municipality has passed its audit. AMSA will then Process the audit by forwarding the information on to WCB, the Workers' Compensation Board, and Alberta en Employment Insurance Agency. A core will then be issued by the Alberta Employment Insurance Agency, sent on to AMSA, and then sent to the successful municipality. This year, Clearwater County scored 90% on the documentation only. As Council may recall, uh, the traditional audit is comprised of three components, documentation, observation, and interview. Uh, this year was a new audit tool that strictly focused on documentation only. Um, so it was a shift. This has been renewed for the next three years. An action plan will be developed from this audit with changes and improvements to be implemented during 2021 as recommended by the auditor. The second item, the Government of Alberta's Bill 48, Red Tape Production Implementation Act 2020, passed second reading. The attached Rural Municipalities of Alberta December 3rd, 2020 bulletin explains how some of the proposed changes will affect municipalities. And that bulletin is attached to this report for Council's information. The third item, Alberta Environment and Parks is seeking feedback from Albertans on sustainable outdoor recreation on Crown Land. Crown Land encompasses approximately 60% of the province, including public lands, parks, and protected areas. This consultation is the first 
innovative under initiative under the government of Alberta's approach to modernizing Crown land management and is guided by the Alberta Crown land vision. The feedback will be used to ensure outdoor recreation on Crown land is funded and managed sustainably and create changes that will better enable partnerships with nonprofit groups, businesses, municipalities, indigenous communities that help support fun, responsible and sustainable recreation on Crown land. The deadline for the survey is January 15th. The fourth item, Clare County offices will be closed from Thursday, December 24th, 2020 through Sunday to January 3rd, 2021. The offices will resume regular hours after Monday, January 4th, 2021. The fifth item, uh, we received some very positive, exciting, in my opinion, uh, news from Costica. I would like to turn it over to Mr. Hagen to expand on that, please. Thank you, Mr. Emmons. Yeah, I'm pleased to share with Council today that uh, the president of Questica sent to us an email. Questica is the budget software that we're using for the first time for the 2021 draft budget. And I'll just read a caption of the letter for you here. For the holiday season, our president does a random draw to help support some of our clients' local charities by making a $1,000 Canadian donation on their behalf. Just been informed that Clearwater County was the lucky winner of that draw. If you could let me know a local charity that you would like this donation directed to, I will make the necessary arrangements. So we thought it would be appropriate for council to have some discussion and advise us if there's a charity that you would like us to identify to Questica to receive that $1,000. Well, that is a lovely lottery to win and be able to put it through to a charity. It is going to be a challenge for us to identify one because there's so many worthy ones in our community. Um, I open it up to our counselors to uh, make some recommendations. I'm not sure who did first, but I'm gonna start ladies first, Councillor Swanson. <laughs> Well, that's, yes, I agree. This is, that's quite a, a lottery to win. And again, I'm just going to put this out there. I mean, we do have lots that we could. Um, maybe as council, we put our, a few of them, we have some uh, spare little notes in our desks. We write down each, I don't, you know, a charity that we would like to, and we pick out of a hat is my recommendation. That sounds like a fine idea. Councillor Lang, I, I did say that uh, I'd put ladies first this time around. Um, Thank you for your patience, Councillor Dunn. First off, I, I want to say I like Councillor Swanson's idea, but the first charity that popped into my mind is the Lord's Food Bank. Um, they always seem to be struggling this time of year to find enough um, uh, food and food hampers to give to those in need. And um, I think Christmas is the great time of the year to distribute as much food as possible. Thank you for your patience, Councillor Duncan. Okay. I'm okay with the suggestion of the names in a hat. Um, I agree with the comments so far. I'm assuming that the Jim Duncan Retirement Fund doesn't in include this. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your humor. We may have to... Uh, find ourselves a few of those little white notes if we could oh, found I found one With so many valuable uh, and worthy charities, I hope we have at least two that are the same and not seven separate ones. <laughs> yeah. 
and that Lucky Charity is the Pregnancy Care Center. Thank you, Council. Well, please pass our thanks along to Questica. And uh, we're very pleased to have a, a very worthy charity it's going to. All right, that then uh, takes, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. I just want to just follow up with number three of uh, Councilor, or sorry, COM's uh, report in regards to the um, feedback form. Being as how the county has 80% of our land base is crown land. I can't stress the importance of us as council advocating for as many people to fill in this survey as possible and whether we can do that through our communications as well to pass that along, that would be great. So I think that is imperative because whatever outcome that that takes, it will impact us a lot. Is there value in uh, having a letter forwarded on to um, the appropriate ministry as well from our council indicating the importance of this survey and some of our thoughts on it? Mr. Evans? Um, of course, uh, administration would definitely draft a letter at council's uh, wish. Um, I would suggest that this municipality is always advocated, um, responsible use of the West Country, looking after our Crown land, proper management, um, I will say it's been a flag that particularly Councillor Duncan has flown high um, and preached that message throughout the province very articulately. But uh, should this council wish, we would be glad to draft a letter of such. Councillor Duncan. What we've seen in the past on some of these is that this is a survey that's sent out to the general public, but there's also an engagement with various groups out there. We saw that with the Bighorn, especially, you know, they came to Clearwater Trails, they came to the Bighorn Backcountry Committee, uh, they came to council, I believe. We had people here. So I, I guess at this time, I would, you know, we, I think we should encourage people to fill in the survey. And, but maybe the inquiry is, and it can just be through administratively, through the back channels even, is, is there gonna be consultation of any different nature on this as well, which would speak to the groups because that's, I think, important aspect of this as well is that they identify the, the wishes of the different groups out there and not just individuals. Um, I, with a survey, like and I'm assuming you could probably go on and fill it out a few times if you wanted to, but um, there's ability to, just, to get as many people from your, your group in there as you want, but, but uh, yeah, given that, I would just say that the, and the importance of, of like Councillor Swanson says, of this in our backyard, that, uh, you know, if, if there's going to be further consultation, that we could hopefully direct that toward our council and other relevant groups in this community. All right. So do we want to leave that at an administrative level, or do you want a letter uh, indicating what uh, Councillor Duncan has just uh, said? Uh, what is your thoughts, Councillor Duncan? I see your thoughts um, on I'm not sure what's, what's appropriate. I would actually say administratively, and I can provide you with the name of the right person, I believe, to, uh, to send that to. Okay. All right. We'll leave that with administration then. There, sorry. Um, this covers more than, and I haven't done the survey, I've just been reading the background. I don't know if anybody else has looked at it, but it does cover more than just recreation, right? There's... Or is it only recreation on this part of the survey? Because there are other things out there that they they manage as well, resources, et cetera. So uh, it's mostly recreation. Okay. 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 Any other questions or comments with regard to the CAO report? I do have one. Councillor Duncan. Just attachment that from the RMA that outlines changes to Bill 48, the offsite levy section there, um, I'm just not clear and you may not have the answer, but it's, the first line talks about expanding the scope to include all types of infrastructure. And then the last bullet on that same one says no changes are made to the scope of infrastructure and facilities. So they seem to be, I'm not sure what they're getting at there um, because right now we're looking at recreation uh, fire is the only, we're the only ones that were, uh, sorry, recreation fire and water and sewer, I believe, were the only ones that were previously allowed. 
I don't know if we know does that means what other things they policing or et cetera that can be added to that. Yeah, Councilor Duncan, they did expand uh, the eligible facilities. Um, their last point I read was the parameters of those facilities um, it has to be capital investment. It has to be oh. was the way I read it. Otherwise, it, from taking it verbatim, it conflicted. Right. Um, but they did expand the scope of the eligible buildings, and you're right. It does it does it now include um, community halls, uh, police station, uh, whereas prior, and even fire, whereas prior did not. Okay. The last bullet then just clarifies it as capital expenditures. So yeah. good. Thank you. Any other questions with regard to the CAO report? All right, seeing none, we move on to the public works report. Always the fellow who marks near to the end of the day. Thank you always for your patience. Do we have any questions with regard to this uh, public works report? I, I did uh, go ahead, uh, Councillor Hoven. On the lagoon summary report, the influent flows and the septage receiving station, are those numbers about what they always are or is there a significant change? Because I can't remember. From what I can gather in my memory, if my memory serves me correctly, they're approximately the same within a couple hundred cubic meters either way. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments? Might be getting off light today. <laughs> Looks like we've, uh, we're good to go then. All right. Thank you very much. That takes us to uh, councillor reports. I know we usually start with Councillor Duncan. I'm going to let you off the hook today. I'm going to start at the other end of the room. Councillor Swanson. Um, the only thing for me is I participated in the virtual econo Alberta Economic Development uh, virtual uh, conference. And unfortunately, I left my report on my other computer, so I will, I will uh, forward it to you all. Uh, it was very good, uh, very... Uh, if you go to their YouTube channel, you can watch their sessions that are available there. If you and uh, quite a mix, um, they're unfortunately there. I didn't see their keynote speakers there, which I understand that they are. Those are uh, copyrighted or whatever, so it's part of their proprietary uh, information. Um, but I will send that report to the rest of council. That was my, uh, I guess, my highlight was the the two day conference. Thank you. Councillor Hoven. I have nothing to report. Councillor Lang. Um, so I partook in the RMA Zoom meeting, this, uh, meeting here, I guess that's about a week and a half ago. Basically, um, they were saying that there's going to be a fiscal reckoning, expect a 25% decrease in MSI funding um, as of February yeah, 2021. Um, the province is decreasing expenditures by 10% in all uh, provincial government departments, budget conservatively. There was talk about the Municipal Measures Index, MMI, um, and it's a way for the taxpayers to get a report card. RMA has not been given the opportunity to look under the hood. Um, and what else? Um, I don't 
don't know if there's much else that we um, haven't already talked about. Yeah, I think I'm leave it at that. We've talked about everything else. Okay, Deputy Vandermeer. <clears throat> well, first, I'd just like to thank Council for your past support uh, for my role at CAPE, the Central Alberta Economic Partnership and then ask for your continued support for my involvement in CAPE for the next year as I was re-elected uh, as chair by acclamation on December the 2nd. So there's a little more work to do there over the next uh, months here. Uh, the other highlight um, was my attendance with uh, Mayor Laird at the CRMA. And my major takeaway from that was the discussion around uh, the fact that numerous municipalities are seeing oil companies trying to address their unpaid taxes. Uh, that said, there are some $200 million uh, that remain outstanding, and that will be the number one focus for the RMA in, to in, in its entirety, the big organization as they go into 2021. Uh, there was some discussion around, you know, particularly around requests by industry for, for the reduction in the penalty portion of their debts there. And it's generally either modestly reduced in terms of those penalties or uh, municipalities are trying not to reduce the penalties because if you do that, you are opening it up to uh, other industries to ask for similar treatment. So uh, my takeaway was that some progress is being made in the industry because they have a few dollars now, perhaps, are becoming more, um, more willing to discuss and settle these outstanding taxes. But it's a lot of work to be done. Thank you, that's it. Thank you, Councillor Lougheed. Councillor Duncan. Uh, just to bring to attention that your package today does have a letter from our, that FCSS submitted to the provincial government on behalf of, of our local regional FCSS. Uh, just trying to address some of that 10,000, or sorry, that 10% uh, cuts we're expecting in, in all departments, uh, hoping that, that that doesn't come to FCSS and we've tried to make our case for the good work that those FCSSs do throughout the province. That's all I have today. Okay. Um, with my report, I uh, emailed it out to each of you. The highlights uh, on it were December the 2nd. Uh, we attended um, the RMA virtual um, update meeting. Um, the highlights in that were, for me, uh, the municipal assessment review and um, how that's going to become a, a priority uh, with RMA early in January of 21 uh, for the, uh, with the provincial government. And they are, uh, as their second priority, unpaid oil and gas taxes. Um, that's also their, uh, that's their second priority. Um, they are also working with uh, the federal government on a internet uh, speed tests, which will be done and collected by residents in the area. This is going to become very important uh, to represent a clearer understanding of uh, the digital divide that we uh, are suffering through, to be very blunt. On December the 2nd, um, that same day in the evening, we had uh, our healthcare professionals uh, meeting. The committee is currently moving uh, from being a committee of council to a committee of the chamber uh, through the Rocky Chamber of Commerce. So as that transitions, I think we'll be looking at what our role is as council members on that uh, committee. Currently, um, the town council has decided to, as we transition, remove their council representation from that committee and put, um, instead of two, two town councillors, they'll add two more um, public uh, folks, so public uh, representation on that. Um, 
Councilor Lang already covered that uh, the information from senior housing. The only thing that I would add to that is um, I've been asked to remain on as chair of that committee for um, the remainder of, I guess, our term. Um, and then on December 4th, we had uh, the Central Alberta uh, Zone meet, and we had a lot of updates. Um, but some dates of note is the next meeting uh, coming up on February the 5th. Um, Mountain View County is hosting. The next fall one will be August 13th, so just right in the thick of things. The deadline for resolutions is January 5th, 2021. And so if we have any resolutions that we would like staff to be working on, we may want to give that some consideration and get that into staff as soon as possible because literally we'd have like a day and a half back in the office. The spring convention will be virtual uh, March 16th and 17th. Choices had to be made. And other than that, we're finding most other municipalities in their updates are working on MDP reviews, some doing land use bylaws, as well as the challenges around uh, the changing landscape of uh, budgets and uh, few, fewer government uh, grant programs. Then uh, we did have our negotiation committee meeting on Friday. We got through uh, three of the four agreements um, and there's just a couple little hiccups uh, in there to be cleaned up. But other than that, it seems to be moving along. The last one will be uh, uh, under uh, administration to work on it and we will see it go forward. And that would be my report in case anybody had any other questions for me. I'm happy to entertain that. Um, congratulations, uh, Deputy Reeve Rand Vandermeer, on uh, being elected as the uh, chair of CAPE for another year. Um, I, I believe we'll be well represented. Thank you for um, being so passionate and putting your time forward to that very worthwhile group. So I'm looking for a motion to accept the reports as presented. Councillor Duncan, those in favor? That is seven to zero and that's carried. Uh, correspondence 11.1 .1 is the Cape Land Inventory Final Report. Who would like to present that? Thank you, Reeve Laird. <clears throat> the uh, information is attached to the agenda for um, council to receive as information. Okay, so looking for a motion to accept that report as information. Councillor Swanson, those in favor? That is seven to zero and it's carried. Thank you. Are there any notices of motion? Oh, uh, Councillor Hoven. You'll have to forgive me if I'm doing this wrong, but I would like a, a notice of motion for uh, that we can release the community broadband business plan from two years ago out to the public. Now, on a point of a process, do we need to vote on that notice of motion? <laughs> I'm going to put staff on the spot there for a moment. While we're waiting for that, why don't we take a five minute recess?
All right, we've had a little uh, break and had an opportunity for notice of motion. We do not need any sort of vote. So Councillor Hoven, and my understanding is you'd like to see uh, information come forward with regard to release of the broadband business plan for the public. So we'll anticipate seeing that come forward in at uh, a future council meeting. Any other notices of motion? Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. Yes, thank you. Um, I have two notices I would like to bring forth. One is that um, a notice of motion for the uh, purchase of conduit, fiber, and optical electronics. Um, sufficient for the connection of 1,000 premises. That's sufficient, I think. Okay. And you said a, there's a second uh, notice of motion? Oh, and, and I, I guess the maybe just a slight correction on that one. Notice uh, purchase of uh, fiber for um, for the final mile is what I should have put in. If, uh, conduit and fiber for the final mile. In other words, the finer materials. Okay. And then secondly, uh, I would like to bring notice that um, that um, a communications plan be prepared that explains the possible deployment of fiber to the premises. <clears throat> All right, any other notices of motion? All right, um, Mr. Emmons, you're clear on those three notices of motion? If council's understanding, then I believe we're good. Okay. Um, the benefit of a notice of motion is the opportunity for council to discuss it and actually Administration can hear the discussion and have a better idea of what council's looking for. So if, if council's clear. Mr. or Councillor Holman. What are the three, I thought. Okay, yours John was... had said two. Oh, mine was included as a third. Yes. Okay. So, um, again, uh, Councillor Hoven, yours is with regard to release of the business plan for uh, for the public um, that may be coming forth, uh, and I'm not even sure it's completed yet. This the business plan we're talking about was the one we did two years ago. Okay. That has been secret. Okay. And then we have. Uh, Deputy Reeve Vandermeers for the purchase of fiber, conduit, and uh, electronics uh, for the final mile sufficient for uh, 1,000 premises. Councillor Lang has uh, a comment or question. I'm just wondering with um, Councillor Hoven's notice of motion and the business plan that was done in the past, Knowing now that there's federal grant money out there, if I were to the premises, that, you know, it's going to make difference on a business plan if we were to currently do a business plan. So I'm not sure if administration can kind of work that into, because you'd be de delivering something based on past knowledge, not current knowledge then. Mr. With, Hagan. With all due respect, Councillor Lang, we couldn't modify that it was prepared by a third party 
And I believe the intent is to share the information that was already provided. Um, I'd be very hesitant to, to try and update it um, short of creating a new business plan at this point. All right, thank you for the clarification. And the third one, which was uh, provided by um, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer, is uh, a communications plan be prepared uh, explaining possible uh, fiber to the premises uh, plan. And that, that's fine. I think what will emerge. We can, yeah. Also, uh, I, I think uh, a result of that would need to be to update at some point to update the business plan to reflect um, the grants and other financings that might be brought uh, to the project. Because as, as um, Councillor Lang has mentioned, uh, the world has changed quite a bit uh, since that last report. So it would need updating at some point. Let's take a look at what we've got and um, decide from that what the next motion might be. All right. If there's no other uh, thoughts on that. Oh, Councillor Duncan. So I'll use the example of, of number three, the motion there. When we discuss this in council, we're not looking at a plan. We're just approving administration to go ahead and do a plan. Is that correct on this? Yeah, uh, we won't. Maybe a little bit on the what it would take or what avenues we would use to develop that plan. Like I'm just, we need to give staff, I think, a little bit more direction here on, on what we're expecting to see come back for any of these motions. Uh, like the, the first one, I, I basically it's what's already been done. It's just a synopsis of, of what's been done and what we can and maybe cannot release because some of it may be uh, privileged information. I the, we'll have to have to leave it up to staff to recommend to us on that, you know, what, what is privileged and what would not be privileged there. Uh, but anyway, I, am I th thinking along the right path there? We're not. Yeah, yeah. I, I think so. Uh, Councillor Duncan, the, uh, you know, I've jotted down a few things that were circulated some time ago that would need to be updated and, and brought into the discussion. Uh, we did prepare a uh, communications plan relative to the, uh, the backbone structure. And uh, if, if uh, we want to move, even if it's slowly, into the fiber to the premise, we need to uh, discuss the points and, and uh, that would be included and council has to agree on them. Okay. Because I, I I agree that if we're if we're moving in that direction, we would need a, a a communications plan. We just don't have any formal motions yet that we are proceeding with a fiber right. to the premises plan. So that was going to be my comment. So I would imagine that we will need to clarify that that would be a change in direction. To be very blunt, Mr. Emmons. Thank you, Reeve Laird. Yes, so. The benefit to administration through notice of motion is exactly this, the opportunity to dialogue out a subject matter um, so that administration would come back with the agenda so that council can indeed make the motion. And if it impacts past motions, then those would have to be rescinded. Um, it would not be coming back at the next council meeting with that communication plan. It would indeed put the framework around the request for a motion. So if that helps council at all. It does, thank you. Are there any other uh, comments or recommendations? Okay. That then takes us into uh, section 13 uh, of our agenda. Um, go ahead. Thank you, Reeve Laird. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> item 5.2 was tabled. And is that up for further discussion? Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. 
He's oh, just pulling it up. Just a second. Uh, maybe I'm... Because your notices of, emotion, of motion are now covered off um, to bring information back. So right. are you lifting that from the table then? Um... Do I have to lift it this time or can I just leave it there? Um, just wanting clarification on the second recommendation. You had broken the three projects separately. Yes. Um, so are you tabling the discussion on the remaining two projects? Yes. Until um, now or are you tabling that into a future council meeting. Oh, to a future council meeting. Perhaps okay. that would be an opportunity for another notice, notice of motion so staff would have time to bring more information forward. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to press the issue relative to what I was trying to get done here today was something that could happen by January 15th. So with these other things, we're certainly not, I'm not anticipating they would be handled prior to January 15th. So they could be deferred past January the 12th, and maybe they could be brought, so something was concluded uh, near the end of January so that an application could be brought in February, perhaps. If that's helpful, no, I, I don't wanna, I don't want to compress everything into this Christmas uh, New Year break. You know, we got to have a little room here. And... Okay, so are we leaving it on the table or do you want to turn it into a notice of motion for the first? Well, can, can I table it to be brought from the table on January the 12th? Or is that the same as a notice of motion? I think it'll be the equivalent of notice of motion, and you could do that now and then at least staff starts working on it. Okay, uh, just make it into another notice of motion, if you like. Councillor Duncan. If it's going to be another notice of motion, then I think we have to lift today's off yes. the table and consider the matter closed and yes. deal with it as a new notice of motion for the next meeting. Otherwise you can leave it on the table. Otherwise you're duplicating because you're basically in some form or another, a couple of your points here are coming forward as new notices of motion, right? But for what we didn't cover today. I didn't see the duplication. Um, so what we tabled today was was part of number two and then three, four, and five. Oh, I see what you mean. Right? So if if you leave that on the table and you've also given notice of motion for a communication plan, which is the same as number four. So yes. I would suggest you do one or the other. You either give us a, a time that you would like to bring the rest of this, what you have on the on table forward, or that you lift we lift it and consider the matter dealt with, and then we would uh, Use notice of motion to do whatever parts of these you wish to proceed with in the future. Okay, uh, I I would lift it and just just deal with the uh, two outstanding points in point two, I guess it was. All right, so we have a motion to lift five point two from the table for further discussion. Who would be making uh, to that? To discuss it, we have to we have to make that motion if we want to discuss it further here That's today. That's right. So who's making the motion? I will make the motion to lift it from the table. Okay. Those in favor? Seven to zero. That's carried. I see that Councillor Hoven has a question. Not at this time. Okay. Okay. 
So, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer, are you considering creating um, additional notices of motion? Yes. Uh, my uh, broadband service is slowing down here in the county office. <laughs> so, it's uh, taking a little longer. Here we go. There we go. Thank you. Just to be clear, I want to make sure we are actually following protocol. Thank you. We are. Okay, so um, I wish to have a notice of motion relative to the two items that remained after the vote in, on point number two. So that would include the uh, Rocky to Nordic Bighorn and the Ferrier through Crimson Lake area. Hello. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, a point of order, the Rocky Mountain House to um, Bighorn, that um, I'm showing that motion has been defeated earlier. No, it was the it was the one to Racinus that was was voted on. That was the only one voted on was. With okay. Racinus. Thank you. Thank you yes. for that clarification. Thank you. Okay. So, um, notice of motion on those two. The remaining two. as written together with uh, my revised, uh, or with my discussion around um, equipment that could be used in a thousand premises, plus the communications uh, plan that could be used for fiber to the premise. Okay. That's it. Are there other questions or comments with regard to uh, is this this is one additional combined notice of motion now for the Rocky to Bighorn yes. or ferry or uh, Rocky to Nordic Bighorn and the ferrier to Crimson. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Councillor, Councillor Holvin. So from the agenda today, item two was to have the grant ready to go January the 15th. So we are, pre we won't be able to make that deadline even if it comes back on January the 12th. Admin and the IT department can't be working on it because they don't have a motion for that until at earliest January the 12th. So does the notice, is the notice of motion still include the January 15th date, the February 15th date? What exactly are we having admin prepare? Thank, thank you, Councillor Hoven, for that um, point. It, it would not be the January 15th. It would be the, that should be changed then to February 15th. We certainly don't, didn't want to uh, try to do something here over this, uh, this break. Okay. Councillor Hoven, do you have some additional comments? I, I, I guess a little confused. I thought Councillor Duncan had moved that we lift it off the table, or was that to leave it on the table? Did I misunderstand the motion earlier? So my, my thought process there, and I probably should have looked to staff here for some confirmation, but in order to discuss this, we have to bring it back up off the table to discuss because this was on our agenda what we have here yes. and so the way forward we've that we've decided upon now on these on this today's agenda item is to defer these two as as notices of motion for a next for our next council meeting the remaining sections of this that we have not dealt with so we're dealing with the agenda item by 
not tabling it, but changing the way it's brought forward. And I apologize if I've gone beyond protocols here, but it's, it's just dealing with it through a notice of motion as opposed to tabling part of, a, of an agenda item here. Yes. That's... It could be done either way, but because we changed the, we changed the, we've changed the direction of this agenda item, right? We've gone from what was here today to something different, which is, you know, our, these, these new notices of motion. Because it's something different, my thought process is that we, we make it new agenda items for the next yes. meeting as opposed to tabling this one till the next meeting because it's not going to be coming back in the same form as it is here today. And I would look to Tracy or Rick if they have any, uh, if we, you know, if we're strained beyond what is technically the right way to do this. Or should we vote on these five motions today and then go forward after that? Because they, I don't, something just seems out of order. Technically, you could, we could force, or you could have that go forward where we would actually have to deal with these and vote yes or no on them. And then a new notice of motion could be brought forward for the next meeting. Um, there's nothing in our no. bylaws that would say that you have to wait six months or anything like that because it's been defeated. It, but it's... Yes, I think that's specifically See, we, we've already, what it says is if once it's been defeated, there's a six month wait period. So for even for a council. OK, sorry. So, so I, I looked. <laughs> OK, that's right. You're correct. So I, I guess I look toward Tracy or Rick if, if you. If we can, if the way I suggested is possible, if not, then we have to somehow deal with this today. And that's specifically why I asked if we were still following appropriate protocol. And it is my understanding, I believe we are. Mr. Emmons, we're well, happy to. No, like this is the problem, and this isn't an administrative one. This is yes. councils, and it's very difficult to involve us now. It really yep. is. Um, there's a number of ways, I think, and I'll look to my team to correct me. Um, you can flat up bring it off the table and make your motions um, and deal with it. It was an agenda that was brought before council for that purpose. It can be dealt with. It can be tabled. Um, to bring forward a notice of motion on motions that were already tabled, I'm not sure what that even looks like. Um, okay. I, I, you know, it was an agenda brought forward. Respectfully, Jim, I, I don't know. Um, we're really treading out into water that I, in my 35 years, I've never had this. Um, so, can you help? So. Councillor Duncan. Um, okay, so just a what if scenario here. We go through, we defeat, are these motions that are before us today are defeated. We've already defeated part of number two. We revised that motion already and defeated it. If, if we go through with the original motions and they're defeated for the January 15th deadline, can a new notice of motion be made to brought that back for February deadline on grant? for the basically the same project. Is that considered a new motion or would that be one that's out, that's not a new motion, it's really the same and it's there I would argue months. that it's a friendly amendment and it really isn't a, a new motion. I would still say I would feel far more comfortably if it was a, an individual that voted against that would bring it back forward. And I think that would take any discernment out of it. Um, okay. I, I don't think change of a date is enough of an amendment to call it a new motion. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the clarity. Mr. Hagen? At the risk of confusing things further, <laughs> I'm hoping to add some clarity. Can I ask, I think we only had two motions come out of that agenda item. About the engineering, that one was passed. This one about the UVF application was defeated. I wouldn't consider the rest of those points on that agenda item motions because I don't believe 
Deputy Revendermeer ever made them as motions. He did not. I, I read them as information, not unlike uh, what we would put forward as a recommendation, other than it's coming from Deputy Reeve. Um, so I don't believe there are any motions on the table right now. The item has been brought off of the table and is open for discussion at the moment. I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that council can either decide to proceed if somebody wants to make motions based on that item or consider the item dealt with at this point and move on. So the cleanest way would be to conclude our discussions on this tabled item now that is being lifted from the table. Mm -hmm. Conclude our discussions and then go back into our notices mo notice of motion section and carry on. So, okay, thank you for the clarity. That was literally how I was reading it as well, so. Okay, I'm confused. So, what was tabled? It was not on a motion that was tabled? Just, just information no, that was just tabled? just the agenda item The itself. agenda item was tabled. Right. Not, there was no motions tabled, just the agenda item. So have, do we need a motion to conclude this discussion? Just to be clear now, I think that might be beneficial at this point. To receive for information. To receive for information, how about that? And that way we can move on to notices of motion and it'll clarify everything. So looking for, a motion to receive the, this document and information as information. Uh, Councillor Lang. All right, any questions? Those in favor? That is six, those opposed to one. That is carried. All right. Thank you for clarifying. It's a little bit of a bumpy road, but we got there. Notice of mo notices of motion. Mr. Vandermeer, or Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. Okay. Um, first notice of motion is relative to the last two points described in the former point, two point and it was uh, relating to uh, Rocky to Nordegg, Bighorn, and Farrier through Crimson Lake. And that would be modified to take a look at it for February 15th submission, possibly not trying to pressure cook this thing into a January 15th. That's just too tough and that was indicated by the last vote. Okay. Have you got that? Are there any other questions? Any questions? Okay. Second notice of motion relates to the purchase of conduit and fiber and the optoelectronics for the final connection of 1,000 premises. Okay, um, as, Deputy as Reeve Vandermeer, yes. you already have that mo notice of motion on uh, presented. Oh, yeah, so it's, yeah, so you, so the only one that needed to be modified was this redo of point number two. Yes, and I have that as the fourth in a series of notices of motion. Okay. That's it. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank our staff for guiding us through what has been a challenging um, set of circumstances today, but we, uh, we got through there. 
So that allows us now to go to um, item number 13, which is our closed session. And so I'm looking for a motion to go into closed session. Councillor Lougheed, those in favor? That is carried seven to zero.
We're good to go. Thank you. We've uh, coming out of our in-camera uh, session. We have no motions to that effect. This concludes the final last regular meeting for 2020. And I, again, like to thank our administration for your continued support. You can find today's council meeting highlights and video posted on our website. And by way of reminder, on um, our next budget meeting is scheduled for December 16th and 17th, so next week, and we will be live streaming that. Our next regular meeting is scheduled for January 12th, 2021. Our council recognizes that COVID-19 cases continue to rise in our community. And we are reminded that life is 10% what happens to us and 90% how we react to it. It is indeed our attitudes during difficult tasks, like the ones that we're currently being faced with that creates successful outcomes. We ask you, to please take appropriate measures and stay safe. I'm looking for someone to adjourn our meeting. Deputy Reeve Vandermeer, all in favor? That is carried, thank you.